Hello, it's Jason Heath here with Contrabass Conversations and a different kind of episode. I hope you're having a good holiday season. Here we are closing out 2019, and I always like during this time of year to do something a little bit different. I've done solo shows. I've done highlight episodes from the past decade plus of the podcast, and today we're doing something that I really think is cool. We're featuring a conversation with Sean Perrin, the host of the Claire and Eat podcast and someone I've been in contact with and have just admired so much over the past three, four years. He has always surprised me with his imagination and innovation and what he does. And we've both had, had our changes over the years. I've actually had Sean on the podcast our, probably like 300, outside of the podcast 400 episodes ago or something like that. I've been on his podcast. And so this is just a deep dive into life, podcasting, business, daily routines, all the sort of stuff I love to talk about with people, whether they play bass or not. So you're going to be hearing actually Sean, I thought about just putting out the interview itself, but then I realized Sean does a tremendous job on this podcast. And I thought I'd just put out the entire episode. And actually it's two episodes. Sean took this conversation, which is a long one, folks. It's two hours combined. Um, but two hours, uh, hopefully, I think you'll find that they're well spent and interesting and entertaining and informative. Um, so I'm just going to put these two episodes together back to back. I'll jump in in the middle. And we're not going to run our typical ad spots just due to the different kind of format here today. But I want to give a sincere thank you to all the folks that have supported and are supporting the podcast. Thank you so much to Upton Bass, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein Music, Diderio Strings, The Bass Violin Shop, and Coda Modacity and A440 Violin Shop. All of these people I've gotten to know over the years, and some of them have been with us for over a decade. So hit them up this holiday season, visit their sites, uh, say hi to them, say at, the hi to them at the next bass event. They're all good people. So They're all people all that I know and everybody like, that's been a sponsor over the years. Really all right, we're going to dig into uh, Clarinet. A uh, double episode with Sean Perrin and myself. If you've ever wanted to create online content, then today's episode is for you. I get the chance to talk about raising funds, getting work done, making important decisions, and how to explore new online mediums with none other than author, podcaster, and all-around extraordinary guy, Jason Heath. Jason is the founder of the Contrabass Conversations podcast, which has been running since 2007, has almost 700 episodes, and gets over 1 million downloads per year. He's also, of course, a veteran of this show, having appeared previously on episode 46, and episode 52. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and this is the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. I want to invite you to head on over to clarinet.com, check out the merch we have there. You can get some cool t-shirts if it's warm where you are, maybe grab a, a sweater. And uh, also you can join the members section, which includes extended ad-free versions of episodes just like this one. And you can ask questions to upcoming guests, an upcoming guest that will be exciting to some people is Angela Miles Beeching, who is the author of Beyond Talent. Also, I'm going to be doing a lot more YouTube content in the coming months, especially in the new year, including an amazing giveaway, which I will announce at 2,500 subscribers. So head on over to youtube.com slash subscribe and hit the notification bell to ensure you're updated as soon as new content comes out. Encoda is a new app that lets you stream, practice, and perform tens of thousands of music scores. It's kind of like Netflix, but for music. Get a free trial today. Just search for Encoda on your device's app store. That's Encoda, N-K-O-D-A. Have you wanted to try Diderio Reads, but weren't quite sure which to choose? Here's how to decide. Reserve Reads come in a white and blue box. They feature a traditional blank and are perfect for those who want to focus sound with the quickest response possible. Reserve Classic Reads come in a white and purple box. They feature a thicker blank that provides an expanded tonal color palette, clarity of articulation, and added flexibility. And the new Reserve Evolution reads come in a white and yellow box. They feature our thickest blank and have a heavy spine for added projection and exceptional tonal depth, warmth, and flexibility. You'll have to try it to believe it. Try Reserve reads now at your local music store or head to clarinet.com reads to buy a box right now. Take your clarinet to the next level with a new mouthpiece, barrel, or bell from Bakun Musical Services. With free shipping to the United States and Canada, 14-day easy returns, and expert advice, you can be sure that you're making the best choice for your musical needs. After all, the best time to upgrade your clarinet was yesterday, but the second best time is today. 
Use code Clarinet at bakunmusical.com and save 10% on your next accessory purchase. That's code Clarinet at bakunmusical.com. So directly from San Francisco in the United States, I'm talking today with Jason Heath. Jason, welcome back on the podcast. It is good to be here, Sean, and it's not the first time we've chatted. I was looking back on your show archives and my show archives. We've been on each other's shows, and we've chatted about all sorts of things, and I just I love what you do and your creativity and energy and imagination, and so it's fun to – it's long overdue, this chat. Man, that I guess was three years ago now, but uh, I want to get a bit of an update since then. Where have you been? Where are you at? And where are you going with all of your different online endeavors? Well, what's what's been going on? Uh, the podcast is now 12 years old, which is crazy. Um, so it's, you know, it would be getting ready for, uh, for middle school or something like that, you know. Uh, but it has, it's been quite a journey. It's, it's sort of morphed into something that I was, I was really trying about three years ago when we were talking, I was really trying to turn it into kind of my, kind of my full-time job. And I, I moved out to San Francisco and I thought, let's just pretend this is my full-time job and maybe it'll happen. And it kind of did, but, uh, what I've decided, and, and we were just chatting before we hit record on this, uh, I decided, uh, not long after we chatted, it's maybe two years ago, to think of the podcast as its own independent entity, and it's sort of self-supporting, and ads come in to pay for everything, and then I have my own career. And then lots of projects come my way via the podcast, but then there's like the Jason Heath career, and then there's the Contrabase Conversations entity. That's a very interesting take on it. I think that's something that I'm starting to realize now in my, I guess it's third or fourth year of podcasting. So my podcast is just a baby compared to yours. But <laughs> um, but that, that's something that I found. And I wonder if earlier on you felt like this too, is that um, my career and the podcast seem to be kind of one and the same. And I do need to find a way to separate those because the Clarinet brand is, is definitely very different from what I'm capable of doing as a musician, for example. Like Clarinet can't even play clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I decided uh, that I didn't want to try to monetize my audience to death. Um, that, and oh, I, they, they, people who are listening will be hearing ads <laughs> run on this show. So you, are, you do have that. But I was thinking about really trying to double down and, and put out as many books as I can on the topic and put out and just try to like get people to get into my online course about this and that. And, and I did some of that and there was some success, but I, I, there's this beauty to me of just just like having these conversations that are just, there's no business model behind it. We're just, I'm just learning. We're just chatting about topics and I just, and, and deciding to not focus on trying to get every dollar I could out of the podcast and just sort of let it be its thing and just have these conversations really freed me up. And something that I think the last time we chatted uh, w w that I did in 2017 that made a huge impact was I got people to help. So I have now, mm -hmm. I believe six people helping on the podcast Wow! and it took a while to wire this whole system together, but I, I chat with people. Then it goes to one of two editors who edit the audio. Then that goes to back in, uh, to somebody who assembles the podcast. And then that all goes to the person who publishes and promotes it online and puts it into the email a newsletter. And then that is all listened to and cataloged and archived by somebody who tracks all the different topics we talk on the podcast for future books and other projects like that. So I was, it was all on me <laughs> doing that, um, <laughs> 2016, 2017, and ever since the show began. And that just, I felt like I got my life back doing that. Totally. And you know, that's interesting because I tried that for a while too. I've recently kind of taken back the reins just to try and, um, keep everything in the direction I want it to move. And I'm also clearly not as organized as you. I, I had some trouble trying to communicate effectively um, what needed to be done. And also the timeframes kind of would expand when you have multiple people involved, right? So if you want to get an episode out, um, like with your six person chain, you've got to know six weeks ahead of time what's happening. Whereas, for example, today, I'm thinking of recording an episode that I'd like to release tomorrow. <laughs> so I can't do it that way through the, the group of people. So although I would like to go back to that at some point, I definitely appreciate the help that I got. Um, um, for now, I'm, I'm kind of trying it uh, grassroots again for a little while to see how how that goes. And it's interesting to hear about the, the the money too, because I mean, one of the things about any online activity is these things cost money. Like you mentioned, you recently got a new camera, and we're going to talk about your YouTube side of things in a minute, because that's kind of I think where 
a lot of digital contents going. Um, but I mean, I imagine that camera was what a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks for a really good one with a with a lens. I mean, these things aren't cheap. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, so the the beauty of however I ended up building this thing and or we built this thing with the community that's behind it um, is I, I just whatever comes in in terms of ad revenue just gets reinvested into the show in some way so that mm-hmm. would be for example yeah getting a good camera and some gear you spend $1,500 go to going to a base convention or something like that that's going to be a couple thousand dollars now I have all sorts of other uh aspects of my career that have developed because of the podcast. So I work as a consultant for different companies, product manager for base for Eastman strings. That's a big chunk of what I do these days. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my, 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 I have a whole, my fingers in a whole bunch of different things, but I do try to have the podcast just sort of the, as it grows, it just, it, it, it just gets reinvested back into it. I love that. You know, I love that you said community too, because I think that's been the most interesting thing for me along this clear and neat path is that when I traveled a couple of years ago at the beginning, even to a couple of places, those were completely funded by the audience down. To, and, you know, to be fair, I prepared well for those. I, I put up the, the, what was it called? Kickstarter or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the website. Yeah. And, but I'd put like to the dollar what I was going to spend and that's exactly what it cost me. And I think that if, you know, have you done any crowdfunding or in that sense? Uh, I've, I've, I have thought about it and I have spent many hours like on the Patreon website. Patreon is actually based here in San Francisco. I thought oh. about walking down and chatting with them. I, I, I'm sure that they've done that a lot of times for podcasters in the area. And I just haven't, um, I just haven't pulled the trigger on it. I just haven't, um, I don't know. I, I, and I know it works and, uh, but I just, and I've, I've, I was even having lunch with, uh, the founder, Jennifer, Rosenfeld. I hope I'm getting her name right. Oh, I know her. Yeah, yeah. And and she was telling me all the reasons why it'd be great to do. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do it. And then I went home and then I totally didn't do it. So um, not to say I won't do it. But for me, I feel like if I went crowd the crowdfunding way, I, and I know like here in the States, uh, public radio, they have, they are, they have donor support, they have advertising, they have it all. But just for me, I, I feel like I'm already uh, selling my audience on a lot of products as it is. I would have, I, I would have to go totally punk rock just in my own head and pull, <laughs> pull all the ads and a hundred percent listener supported. So just for me, it's like, I either want th- that dial all the way on or all the way off. So I've just decided. And I've, and, and also I seem to have the, the machine seems to keep running. So I just don't want to, once yeah. I start poking around and that's, that goes for also websites. Are there things I want to fix in my website? Yes. Are there ways that I could make the pro- podcast process better? Yes. But sometimes when you got something running uh, there, there's so much energy invested in trying to like change it, that it's, it's better. I feel like I do better when every one to two years I dip in and like, okay, let's change my web host or something. Cause I know I'm going to lose like a week. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and I realized for those listening that I just kind of interrupted myself, I will come back to my point in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, also this is an interesting kind of insight. Like I know a lot of people are considering starting their own means of online um, careers, be it a YouTube channel or maybe their own podcast, not about clarinet though, um, <laughs> or something like that. And I hope this is kind of insight insight that you can use as well. Um, but as far as the crowdfunding goes, like with Clarinet, what I've done with Patreon is I realize there's two types of listeners. There's those, and they've told me so through Facebook surveys and things that they just would prefer to have more ads to listen to than pay for the podcast. But then there's other people who are willing to pitch in a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. Um, and they, for me, what I do is they get an ad free episode that is extended. So it has a little bit of bonus content in it. It takes me only about five or 10 minutes more to just strip out the ads and publish again. But there's 57 people in there who all really are keen on getting that. So um, yeah, and if that's something that interests you as you're listening, like I definitely encourage you and, and you should know that there all the ads and things that are here they're not, they're not on that side of things. So you can kind of pick the kind of value that you want. Um, do you want to directly support it for, you know, less than a cup of coffee? Or do you want to just listen to a couple ads? And the ads I try to make super relevant, like, I mean, Dario reads and Bakun clarinets, um, what could be more relevant to a clarinet player than those ads? That's, that's why I don't do like the whole, this is sponsored by Audible or <laughs> well, it, it kind of is because you can still go try audible and you know through an affiliate relationship you can support the podcast but i haven't done like full length ads for that or for invoice to go or whatever else it's just not 100 percent relevant and to me that's important 
Yeah, if you're in it for the long haul, you wanna you wanna make sure that you're really like everything that I everyone I have as a sponsor is somebody that I know that I've met with the exception for the first time ever. I, I, I'm using I am using the app and Coda, but this that's the only sponsor I've had that I don't personally know, haven't met in person. Every other mm. person, every other company, I've spent time with them. I use the I use the strings. Dario sponsors this podcast too. I, right behind me is my base with my Kaplan's on from Diderio <laughs> and uh, you know R rosin company comes on I use their rosin um, so I really try to I, say you know I only take things that I actually believe in so I also don't have yeah like uh, stamps.com yeah yeah whatever. exactly well and it's not that those things aren't valuable too but like I don't think that stamps.com cares about developing a great podcast for the clarinet community whereas you know, these companies do. So that's what I think is so great about choosing the right sponsors. But to go back to the um, the uh, the cr crowdfunding for a minute, I see so many people coming on and they're like, oh, crowdfund me my new clarinet because I'm a poor student. Like, that's not a good enough reason. You got to give something back, you know? And and so when I did the crowdfunding for the trip, it was like, this is what it's going to cost dollar for dollar for me to get there. This is what I'm going to do. You're going to get a, a nice video out of it and hopefully a bunch of content. And those relationships, like, us meeting, for example, are still leading to new content like today. So that was what I call a really good investment. And I hope that the people who contributed, you know, five or $10 to that, or even just a dollar or two, I hope they feel like they got their value worth uh, from it. And um, because I, I appreciate it, but I also think that it took the podcast further. And that was kind of the point. Well, I've been moving in the direction of doing uh, ever increasing percentage of my uh, podcasts at events on location. And mm. so in four days, I'm going to Australia and I'll be in Australia wow. for 11 days. And so thank you sponsors for making that happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and the crowdfunding model w w is a, something that definitely would be uh, something that I I'll consider in the future for trips like that. But uh, I'll, I have the opportunity to connect with probably 10 to 12 bass players and different orchestras, jazz bassists over there. I'm taking in this event. I'll bring my camera, of course, get some great footage of the Melbourne Bass Day, the largest bass event in Australia. It's its third year. And then get to put that out to the world. And so the way that um, the way that things have been evolving for me have been in, I do bursts of interviews like that. I mm. went to the International Society Bases Convention. And I think I did 25 interviews. Oh my and then God. I do no interviews for like months. There is, there are. And so the way I've been working these days and I, I, Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil have talked about this before. Uh, uh, they say, get ahead, stay ahead. And that's yeah, totally yeah. what, what I, what I do. So I, I go and I, I, so I have this like giant backlog of episodes and then I, I get, I try to time it. So I'm just about to get to zero when I have another big event. So I'm running out. I'm, I'm finally out of those episodes from the base convention that was in June. So here we are in November. It took me that long <laughs> to get through them. And then I've been doing some, I don't want to call them filler, but I've been doing some Skype interviews because I knew I'd need to get over this like three, four weeks. And then I'll, I'll be set through like March of 2020 at which point I'll be in Texas talking to people. So my sort of, uh, my flow has evolved to like maybe three to five times a year, just going nuts on the podcast mm -hmm. and then putting it into this machine. And, and what I have to do on my end, maybe one day a month, I sit down and all I do is the podcast and just like all the little nitty gritty and writing yeah. up stuff. And I just like lose that entire day. Um, but otherwise it's like, there is no podcast. Um, but what, what it's been a great that I, I tell everybody they should start a podcast and I don't care if they're bass players or not. Um, but clarinets shouldn't they, yeah. but, 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 but anyway, because it's such a great self-improvement project. Yeah. So like I would, I would want to have all the conversations I have, I would want to have anyway. And so the podcast is just this nice framework in which to have that conversation. Well, and that's uh, what I love about online content is like, and, and especially why I like podcasts over radio, it's because it's, it's not that I like something that's less produced, but, and you know, obviously the podcast would be better if it was more produced in some ways, like, but I just love the realness of podcasts, like listening to two people talking. And, and it's the kind of thing I listen to when I'm in the car too, you know, things like contra-based conversations. That's how I found you was through 
listening to your podcast is one of the podcasts that I've been checking out. And it was, you know, it was kind of cool to get to talk to you the first time. Not as cool now that I No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but, but going back to what you were saying earlier, that that's so some of some of my best friends I have met through this medium and our relationships yeah. have have blossomed as a result of this. And it's like this. It's like this never ending. Well, th- that you can go back to like like for me, I think of my podcast as like the Tonight Show. Not that uh, obviously that's like, I don't but it is that. Scale. for basis it is yeah that. there's and no have, show yeah 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 sorry go ahead yeah, and i have i no no i have people come back i had i have had somebody come on seven times at this point wow. um because they just start doing new projects or oh wow we're gonna be at this conference let's talk about jazz and what you've been doing oh you've got this new and and so there's no it's not a one and done thing it's like and and almost all I'd say 95% of the guests I have on these days are straight from the community um, that I have. I have these, this spreadsheet I started years ago with everybody that's been recommended to me. And I even put like how many times, and then I lost that spreadsheet and then I found it again, <laughs> but I started another sheet and I've got, I've got, I could, I could do one of these a day for the rest of my life and I wouldn't even get through 10% of those names. So I realized, yeah. Oh, there's no end to this if I don't want. And, and so it's, it's just like a really good, self-improvement thing like it may it forces me to sit down reach out do some research learn about something i don't know and so for me it's all upside the only downside is time and yeah. money you know? yeah well it's so funny because like i remember too early on um i had a lot of people on and i'm just over the 100 episode now i think i'm at 120 probably 124 by the time this comes out um so i'm just now thinking about going back and reaching into the people who I've told, let's have a second interview, for example, um, some of the very early episodes, like episode, you know, five or six, I'm sure there's people that I was like, hey, let's chat again in the future. And I still haven't come back to them three years later. But um, it doesn't mean that we can't. And I have started to do this. I mean, Stanley Drucker has now come on three times. And uh, I never thought I'd get the chance to talk to him at all. So and uh, it's just super cool because even they sent me the, the latest CD they put out and, and I was really surprised to see this, but they thanked me in the liner notes as one of the people who's, you know, contributed to his career. And I thought that was super awesome. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, not to interrupt this show, but now to tell you about stamps.com. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's cool. So you're building the, the beautiful thing and you're into over 100. Congratulations, by the way. And, thank you. and I even looking back in my archives, episode 310 of my podcast was Sean Perrin on one year of podcasting. Yeah. So um, and, and I'm at a 650 probably by the time this comes out. And and I realized after I got over that 100 episode mark that I really was building an archive that mm-hmm. could be go- going back. And then so that's why I'm so thankful Krista Copper, who shout out to Krista, who does all this thematic cataloging of what we talk about, what that, what I have this Evernote document shared with Krista and the other people on the team. And when I want to look up a topic, I type in like right hand technique or whatever, you know, or, um, Homer Mensch or, uh, or trills or you name it. And I can find all the instances on all the podcasts where that topic has been talked about. And I've been starting to pull together these best of shows on top about once a year I do a, a chunk of them and then going down the line two years five years or something that I'm sort of writing a book by doing that well, and you so literally I, are we had you on yeah. about your book uh, yeah, yeah I write about, about the audition book and so yeah. I'm realizing that 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 this is just sort of happening as a result of the podcast so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting medium and I love listening to podcasts just like you I go out for my run or I'm you know yeah commuting or whatever and it's just like it's a part of my day and, and I I love the open-endedness of of the medium. It's just really been an incredible thing to get into. So tell me about your your kind of working process because you seem like one of the most organized people I can even imagine. Um, do you have like a, a like a daily method or like some sort of yoga that you do <laughs> or like how do you how do you keep your mind so focused? Well, the the well, I decided to and and I I have no kids. I have my I have a lovely wife there and we no, live here in San Francisco. <laughs> so so and I decided when I moved out here that I didn't want to be running around like a chicken with my head cut off playing gigs 2 hours uh, it, 
all around San Francisco. That's kind of what I did in Chicago. So I just, I decided I was going to work eight to five Monday through Friday doing whatever. Uh, and I, and I started off just working on the podcast that so Monday through Friday, leave the weekends open. So like when I'm on, I'm on, uh, but, but back in the day I would be editing these things at four in the morning yeah. or at midnight when I come home or in the car before a gig. And, and so I've done it all. I've done interviews in the car, you know, outside in a parking lot recording recording my cell phone to something. So, but these days I do that. And, and in terms of just the podcast, um, in terms of reaching out to people, it's total, it's, it, I don't really have much of a method. It's like, Oh, fine. Yeah, it, a lot of the time it's someone suggests. And then I finally think, Oh yeah, I need to do some episodes or I'm going to event. And then I research who's going to be there. And I talk to them there uh, in terms of actually doing these. I, I really enjoy the method I've come up with for doing these chats. And for every single person I talk to, whether it's a high school student, which I have interviewed high school, school kids or Christian McBride or somebody. It's the same process. It's like start an Evernote doc and just dump. Uh, it's total go like going down every rat hole I can on the person and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and any articles or interviews. And then, and then some people there, I've talked to some amateur basis and there's nothing on them. Right. You know? And so I, uh, but regardless, I try to, I try to everybody I talk to, I try to do a, a decent amount of research and I'll do it you know it could be at least a few days before generally though it's weeks before and and i just kind of it's this just mess of stuff in evernote and then uh the day of i open up on my ipad pro i open up a blank sheet and i just take a few notes on like one screen on the ipad pro and i do the same thing for everybody and i only let myself write one page worth of notes mm. possible topics or whatever and then that's it when i talk to somebody i don't i don't look at it at all but but I have the pad there to write down little things that come into my mind or that sort of thing. And I have all that saved in Evernote. And I love that because I just chatted with one of the Los Angeles Philharmonic bassists. Well, I talked to him 400 episodes ago. And it's so wow. cool to be able to call up those old o notes in, in Evernote. And, oh, yeah, we talked about this. We talked about that. Oh, there's the link to his old album. Boom, listening to it. And so that building an archive kind of thing, I wish I could grant public access to my Contrabass Conversations published folder. You know, I, 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 the, my, I, I have too many personal cell phone numbers in there for that to work. But, <laughs> but um, it's Well, there's so an idea for your Patreon, though. You know, if you were people supported the show, maybe they could get some bonus content like that, yeah. you know, with the personal info stripped out, something like that. Yeah, see, now you got me thinking about the Patreon again. I, 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 I'm going to be, I'm going to be, yeah, I know, I know. Well, I gotta, this is the thing, yeah. too, because I remember when I first started the podcast, I was super like, uh, I think people underestimate, um, what's the word, the uh, the pressure it felt like at the beginning, because I wanted to do a good job, and I'd also never done interviews before, and I'd never made a podcast before, and I, I'd never met these people before, and I wanted them to take me seriously, so I would do like a day of research and same thing have like all these questions like a scripted sort of path for the interview I hoped to go down and um and nowadays I don't do that because I find it's better just to get to know kind of the person and same thing I write a one sheet and I just work from that because I find it's better to just let the conversation flow and know what I'm talking about um but the ironic thing is when I started doing that like literally the episode I started doing that someone contacted me and said you know the show used to be so good but now it's so scripted and I don't like that <laughs> And I was like, well, you might be surprised to learn that it's actually the opposite now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny. It, it makes me remember if you think back to when you started clarinet versus where you are, where you are now or me. I got into conducting a few years ago and like I was bad for years. You know, you yeah. have to, it's just it's a skill that you practice. I was a bad interviewer when I when I, when I started this show. Like like it's super awkward to listen to those early episodes. Oh, I hate I, them too. Mine, yeah, mine not, I mean. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's, it's, but it's a skill you develop. And I think it's a great skill. It's it, po doing a podcast d develops skills that you can use in other areas of your life really well. It makes you a better public speaker. I think it may, it, it, it forces you to actually listen and, th and, and, and it's just, it develops a lot of skills that can apply in lots of business settings, musical settings. I have gotten to be such a less um and ah person as a result of this. Mm, I still say <laughs> um and ah, but oh yeah. my goodness, you should have heard it back in the, in the day.
Yeah, I've been, I listen back and my big problem word that I tend to say is absolutely. The number of times I've deleted the word absolutely from a podcast is, is just absolutely appalling. But um, <laughs> it's it's true. It's really bad. And I, I've, I But I now listen more to my own speech too when I'm talking. And um, it's made me a better clinician for sure. I go to, you know, schools or to present to people about the instrument and, and it's, you listen to what you're saying. I know that sounds kind of dumb, but you you do pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth, which is a pretty important skill. Here's here's something that happens to me a lot. I, I get up, and this is usually when I'm doing Skype chats. This did not happen today, by the way, because we're friends and I know you. But a lot of the time, I'm like, I'm like, God, I don't want to do an interview today. I really don't want to do it. And and and, and, and it's like, and, and I don't know why I say that. I think part of it's like there's always like a little bit of fear is the wrong word, but like a little anxiety maybe about doing it, which is good. It's like going on stage or something. And every time when I get done, I say to myself, and I've said this every time, that's the best possible use of my time. That's the best thing I could have done with my time is sit down and chat with that person and really get to know them. And I, that I have that happen so much. It's like, uh, interview day. Yeah. Dang it. Why'd I, why'd I schedule an interview yeah. today? Uh, yeah. And then I get on and then I do it. I'm just so happy I did. So I know, and that happens to, to me with trips too, like this Australia trip coming up in four days. I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I want to go to Australia. I don't want to get on a plane for 17 hours. Yeah. I like that. And I know as soon as I get there, I'm going to be like, Oh, this is the best thing I could have done with my time. I come back. This is the best thing I could have done with my time. So that's just me with this stuff. Do you ever have the sensation that you recorded a podcast and at, when you're done, you realize, or you think to yourself that it, Oh my God, that didn't go that well. Um, and then you listen back later and it's actually like one of the best that you've ever done or <laughs> this kind of thing. I have this all the time. Yes, it, it that I, that absolutely, I, and I have because I have this whole process and team built up. I have a really weird. It's so different than it used to be because I used to be so aware of what we talked about and everything. These days, I get done and I I close this iPad doc and it's like gone from my head. I I, yeah. I can sometimes even barely remember if I chatted with somebody. But then I, every once in a while, I don't listen to my own podcast that much, but I do jump in every once in a while just to make sure that like my podcast exists <laughs> and, and, and I listen and then like, Oh yeah, that was really interesting where we went on that path. And also I do also, because I realize it's going to vanish from my head. I make sure to take notes about the topics we talk about. So when I do my intro and outro, um, I can remember what we talked about. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, one thing, one disadvantage to doing it the way I'm doing and having a team is I definitely feel less connected to the podcast. Um, like I forget who's coming out. Uh, every week. I'm like, Oh, I guess they're coming out. And I always make sure to email the person and thank them and send them a link when it does come out. But I feel for me that that was a conversation that I was just personally benefiting from. And mm -hmm. that happened at this point, like months ago, typically for the podcast. So I'm sort of living in a different reality than the podcast. My life is like time shifted from my podcast. And it wasn't that way when I was like, chatting with someone putting out immediately. I miss that, but I couldn't be living my life the way I am now. If I was doing it all, it, it just wouldn't, it, it wouldn't work. <laughs> well, I tend to, even if it's not going to come out the same day, like this is probably not going to come out for a couple of weeks, but, um, I will probably sit down this afternoon and just quickly edit it and record intros and outros because it's fresh. Cause same thing. If, if I come back to this in a week, I'm gonna have to listen to the whole thing again to get a gist of what we talked about. And it's going to waste my time. <laughs> so you talk about like the best use of your time. I mean, it's pretty important to do things while they're fresh in your head. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I was I was in such a good rhythm, and I've fallen out of that rhythm. But I talking to you now, I got to get back into it. My I had for a little while, I had a really good thing going where I would chat, and then I would immediately go in and record an intro and outro, and then that and then that would go into into my Dropbox sequence, and I was good. And I don't know, I've for some reason I I think I've just got too many projects on my plate right now. It seems like every day I have just barely enough time to fit it all in. So I, so what I've been doing these days is I just like, well, like I said, take one day a month and it just, I just like, you know, that day is like destroyed, you know, it's nothing but podcasts. And so, but I have to do what you're talking about. Like, what did we talk about? Where did that, how did that happen? <laughs> so the notes seem to help. <laughs> well, you have to actually, and this is going to sound absurd for people who um, weren't trying to live the life I was living a couple years ago where I was running around town and doing gigs and podcasting and everything you were talking about. Um, but I found that I actually had to literally schedule like this four hour block is podcasting time. And if I didn't do that, it would be three in the morning and I'd be up. And, and these days too, it's like, all right, this morning I'm going to get up, I'm going to get some work done for work. I'm going to podcast with Jason Heath for a couple hours. I think I'll probably edit for an hour or two. Then I'll do some more work. And then this evening I'll 
do some more work and then I'll go to bed. <laughs> but, but if I don't think like that, the podcast just always gets pushed to the side and it never really bubbles to the surface of priority because let's be honest amongst my job and you know, my, my child and need to eat. Like, it's never going to be like, Oh my God, the podcast must happen now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's gotta be so different with kids too. Like I can't even, because I, I, I'm able to, probably to have, and I'm sure it changes as, as kids get older, probably, but, um, <laughs> I, I'm able to, I'm able to schedule my time. I, my, my, I can, I can schedule my time without worrying about it. Something, somebody getting sick or something like that. So I, I take a screenshot of my, of my calendar and I usually do this over the weekend and I, and I, so I can see all my commitments and I put it into, I use uh, notable on the iPad. I've used lots of note taking apps, but I do that. And then I look at that and I, I block out through the week week what hat i'm going to be wearing so like mm -hmm. one day is going to so like usually if i do an interview that's the day i'm also going to like bang out a couple hours of podcast uh related tasks like you're talking about and then i actually get out of the house i i have i would love to have mul a multiple screen set up uh, my place in san francisco is too small for anything right now so i actually go to a co-working space a few days a week and i just i just work on projects that are appropriate for there so i'm not playing my bass i'm not doing interviews but i'm like you know whatever doing research or emailing people about various projects or that kind of thing and i i love that i actually go to amazon web services AWS has a co-working space here in San Francisco. Oh, I nice. love going there. Y Combinator, this famous startup accelerator, is in the same building. And I just feel like I'm in Silicon Valley, the HBO show or something, you know. And so, so that's that I get really good work done at one of those places. But then I have days that are all home and just base, or if I'm filming a video or something like that, then th that's gonna be a home day. Well, it's important. And this is why I appreciate so much the, you know, the help on Patreon and from the advertisers, is because they've allowed me to with good conscience um say no to a lot of the driving around and stuff i used to do and spend that time on the podcast and i at first it was hard because i was like oh i'm not involved in the community as much anymore but in a way i'm more involved i just can't tell um right. so how do you uh deal with that though like I, i'm not teaching or playing nearly as much as i used to how do you feel like you're still an involved bassist well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep, uh, I'm trying to, I didn't to mean keep... that insult by that, by the way, oh, I know no, that you're no. very busy. You're, <laughs> you're busier than me. <laughs> no, 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 no. But no, that's a good point. That's something I think about a lot. And I, I've sort of what, what I'm doing right now, it's certainly subject to change is I want to play a little and I want to teach a little. And if mm, I'm not yeah. careful, both of those will blow out of control. And, and I ended up taking on way too much in the teaching department last year. And I realized I'd made a big mistake. It was one of those things that I, I was just like walking through an airport, having a conversation with somebody and they're like, Hey, can you fill in for this one thing? And I'm like, sure. Before I knew it five days a week, I was in the middle, middle schools in San Francisco t teaching, t coaching base. Like for, yeah. I, I realized, Oh no, I, I'm teaching, I'm teaching public middle school almost full time, you know, for not full time pay. Uh, what have I done? I, I said, yes, yes is a very dangerous word. So, so, <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't want to not teach at all. So I got rid of all of that, except the one school it's one hour a week and it is, uh, I can see it from my window practically. So I, it's, it's go in, you know, so I'm doing a little bit of teaching and I think that's healthy. I have a couple of private students. I say, I've had lots of people contact me. I always say no just because of time except i've had these two since i moved to san francisco so and then in terms of playing uh i'm get, a lot of the travel i do i end up playing uh, as a result of that and and so i i made it sounds snobby but i just decided if the san francisco symphony calls or an equivalent gig i say yes otherwise i just say no and i was just playing san francisco symphony last week now which is, i uh, you know that's awesome. And I love it. So I, I do want to have some playing. I feel like I'm not, I feel like I lose connection with my artistry if I don't do any, um, yeah. but it's changed a lot. I used to, like you were talking about dry, you know, I was teaching, playing seven days a week, driving all over the place. I think and that was when we I, first talked, you hadn't moved yet or you were about to move. Um, yeah. And you were like in the midst of driving all over everything. And we, I remember thinking we had a very similar lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I started to do a lot of that when I moved to California, because I was just like, uh Oh, I got to earn some money because yeah. San Francisco is expensive. And this math is really bad on <laughs> what's coming in and out in terms of rent and cost of living. Um, but, but things started to, I started to realize, Oh, I have this limited resource of time and I need to be very careful how I use it even and and um so yeah that's been a, a tough balancing act and i 
I love the community. I love being around people. And so I, it, it stinks that for me, the best use of my talents uh, in my opinion, end up putting me in front of a computer by myself a lot. And even yeah. though podcasting is social, like we're talking, I'm still, it's like, we're just in these rooms by ourselves. And, and so it's, it, it's also, it's funny, so much of what I do. And I, and I know so much of what you do is quite solitary, very different than like, I love going into school and having all the chaos and all that. But, but it like, it, you're, I feel like I have this, this like jar of energy every day and I can allocate it to a few things and, and I got to be really careful. Um, so like I go, in and I would, even if I went in and taught like three hours in one day, I would be like destroyed creatively. I just, yeah. and I think it's just because I put so much into that or like even with playing last week, I wasn't able to do anything on, on the, the project now, but it was worth it because it was San Francisco symphony. But if I, I could easily have said yes to a gig that paid one tenth of that and was the same time commitment. And I'm guilty, not guilty. That's the wrong word, but I, I've done that a lot in my life. So it, it is tough, but I, I, I get sad if the playing and, and, and teaching get dialed to zero. But if it's more than like 5% of my time, uh, I start to feel like I'm not spending my time right. Because I, if uh, here's, here's something I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but an opportunity comes my way. And if I can think immediately of five people that would do a great job of that, I try to not take that opportunity. Hmm. So like if someone says, hey, you want to teach my kid? I'm like, sure, but I can think of five people that would do just as good a job. Okay, that's not the opportunity. But doing this podcast, I don't know who I would recommend to like do exactly what I'm doing in terms of that or some of the projects that I consult for. And so I try – and now, now something like San Francisco comes up, I could think of a lot of people to recommend, but I'm selfish and I want to do it. So, <laughs> so, but that's kind, of, that's kind of been my – and one more and then I'll shut up. I've no, no, that, trying, that's exa- I was, my follow-up question was going to be what's your decision-making process? So feel free to. <laughs> oh yeah, well the the invent the creator of CD Baby and of course I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, but he he w- has a metric he uses for uh, choosing projects. And apologize to my audience because they're here. They've heard this many times. But I try to every opportunity that comes up, I try to rank it on a scale of one to ten. But I can't use the number seven. So uh, I that's a because so why many not? Projects- Is it too too middle of the road? Is well, too wishy washy? Yeah. Well, it turned it, it. This is this is uh, the name will come to me, but uh, the CD Baby founder. That's his metric. And if you do that, it's either going to be one to six or eight to ten. Well, if it's eight, that's pretty close to a nine. That means you're pretty excited about that project. If it's a six, I mean, that's like almost a failing grade. Um, and and you realize when you do that, how many things come your way that you're like a seven about? You know, mm-hmm. it's like yeah, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty well, good. You know, I was listening actually to Garrett Hope's podcast um, uh, called Portfolio Composer one time, and he had a guest on, I just can't remember who it was, who shared this really interesting method with me. It's like a triangle system. Have you heard about this? Uh, I No, I don't think so, but I, I listen to Garrett's podcast too. Shout out to Garrett. But, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I actually, sorry, quick, I actually got together with Garrett here in San Francisco. We had some fabulous oh, Mexican food. Yeah, like, oh, a, nice. like maybe three, four months ago. Another benefit to this podcast com- community, uh, this sort of thing, and these friendships that you develop from meeting people through this. But uh, no, I don't. Tell me about this three, three part method. Yeah, so the triangle. way it works is that you have a triangle, and you imagine in each corner of the triangle, one corner is will this uh, activity or thing I'm being asked to do, will it enhance my career? Does it pay appropriately? And will I enjoy it? And so what you want to try and do is focus on opportunities that fill all three corners. And if you don't have any three corner ones, you fill two corners. And if you can't find two corners, you go looking for them because you shouldn't do one corner activities. Um, and I found it really interesting, especially for, for you know younger students, is that like you may not have the three corner opportunities. So while you're looking for them, you can take as many two corner ones as you want, um, but you need to be pushing for those. And, and I found it's been super, super helpful. So like today talking to you on the podcast, like it's fun. It's going to advance my career. You know, the podcast is supported by listeners, all three points check, you know, going and doing a clinic at Mount Royal, where this is where I work. You know, I like to work there. It's, it pays appropriately and it's going to advance my career. Yeah. I mean, just like you said, though, I can't do too many or it'll overwhelm my other activities, but I do like to have the remaining you know, bit of teaching that I do 
and and they're performing and all that. But it also opens the door to like, okay, a community orchestra has called me. They don't have a budget, but I really love the piece and I'm going to enjoy working with those people. And it's a piece I've never played before. I'm going to have a chance to play. You can still do it if there's no three corner stuff around. And it, it totally frees up your mind to be like, oh, it's okay to not get paid sometimes. Or it's okay to not even have fun sometimes if you're only going to get yeah. paid and advance your career, right? So it's an interesting system that I've really used a lot. It's a, that's a good system. That that is a very I, I really like that one. I'm going to think about that when when projects come up. There's a similar system that uh, a, you know Andrew Hitz, the entrepreneurial musician, his business partner Lance LeDuc has a system uh, called uh, when you're evaluating whether to take a gig. It's got to be two of the three uh, meet two of the three criteria. And so it's either pays well artistically good or good hang so it's got to be two of the three and i think that's a really good one because i wonder I'll if it's the... his show i got it from then instead because that sounds very similar but i've kind of put my own spin on it over the years yeah yeah well and that definitely particularly for gigs makes sense um but i yeah. but i i thought about that a lot because i've definitely uh taken a lot where i don't get two of the three you know uh one of the three you're gonna be sad uh two of the three three of the three like for me last week san francisco symphony boom 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 yes uh, you know yeah but um yeah well, it no, makes what good- seem you know very yeah. complex decisions some of these things like and, and a lot of people don't think enough about the decisions they say yes to i think it was warren buffett who said something like um um the difference between successful and very successful people is very successful people say no almost all the time something like that and it's totally true and actually on my little sheet that I was going to show you I have a a, a workshop calculator so I know what I want to get paid I know what it will cost me in miles like this is not something I just made up this is what the actual cost is to me and I'll be in the hole financially if I don't recoup that money Um, so anyways I have this calculator of what I should feel like I'm getting paid and if it doesn't reach that I I have to say no (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's yeah. that's that's yeah. the way I work. And I have like a little list of quotes on the side, like still feeling doubt, like read these quotes. <laughs> and so it's a funny little thing I made up in, you know, Apple numbers or something that helps me make decisions because I'm not good enough sometimes at making decisions for myself. I'm too likely to be swayed by, oh yeah, but I knew that person from whatever and I should do them a favor or or you know, I have nothing else to do that day. That is not true, but that's how <laughs> you might feel. Um so no, that's super interesting insight thanks for for sharing all that we've uh, as i knew it happened we've been chatting for a while now and we um have touched on a bunch of great subjects but we still haven't talked about youtube so before we move on from today's conversation i want to really just ask like you've done some great content on podcasts of course and the blog um but you've also recently and more so recently been delving into youtube so what's that been like what's the editing like were there any challenges and what gear are you using any other you know recommendations you have Sure. Yeah. And for, for me, I'm approaching it. And I think this is a good way to approach any project. It's something I'm just looking to develop my skills. And if things connect great, and if not, I don't really care because I'm developing my skills. And I think that's a healthy way to look at doing a podcast or, or starting a blog or something like that. Um, I have had, I've like, like many people um, who do what I do, I've had a YouTube channel for a long time. I've had one since probably 2005. And I have some videos that have done that have got a uh, quarter million views 300,000 views something like that yeah. from back from back in the day or from certain events but I personally like like uh, Peter McKinnon is a photography uh, uh, blogger or vlogger that I follow you know it has probably 11 million people following or something like that I haven't done many of the more contemporary sort of style YouTube videos that that with you know quick cuts and and good b-roll and stuff so I just decided to get better at doing like visually engaging videos. And so that's been a fun process. And I realized quickly, uh Oh, I need a better camera. I was trying to do it with my iPhone. And then I had this zoom, uh, camera and everything just looked like garbage. Um, so I ended up buying a Canon EOS M50, uh, which is a mirrorless DSLR style camera and, and getting a few different lenses, did some research. I ended up getting the Canon, the nifty 50, which is this, uh, 50 millimeter lens. It ends up being like an 85, 
35 millimeter lens with uh, when I put, because anyway, for reasons that don't matter that much, but um, it, it does well in low light and it gets that really nice buttery, blurry background. And I got some lights and I've gotten some mics. And so I can finally get like me looking about as good as I'm going to look <laughs> and, <laughs> and get, getting the, getting good audio. And all of that is, is fun. And it's a major challenge in my tiny San Francisco place. You know, it's like, I have to sort of figure all that out, but I've been having fun getting better at storytelling through video. So I've been, I've been taking, I did one on how extensions work and I shot all this slow motion of me, like moving around the extension. And then the title comes up saying where I am and what I'm doing. And I went into Adobe illustrator and made some kind of cheesy graphics, but I'm getting better, you know, and edited it all in Adobe premiere, uh, and, uh, did the, audio balancing everything in Adobe Audition. So I'm just trying to get better at storytelling through video and using Adobe products. And I don't care if it does well or does. I mean, of course I want things to do well, but I've had some that are total flops. I did one after ex incredibly time consuming after effects video where I had like this text bouncing around and it's gotten like <laughs> no views, no views. And I probably spent like 60 hours working on that stupid thing. So it's like, all right, I know they don't want that. So <laughs> not going to, but I learned some great skills doing that and I and I will probably use some of that for some video intros and even if I don't it, it, I just kind of think of it like a hobby and it, but but it is a hobby that I it's it's already helping me in some other things. Like I'm as a result of doing all this, my thumbnails for my blog posts are getting better. Cause I've yeah. been thinking about it more. I'm yeah. it's, I've, I've started to take photographs on the weekend, which I never used to do going out with my camera. And so it's, it's one of those things that's like, it's good for what I do professionally, but it's also become like a fun hobby and self-improvement project. Well, it is Seth Haynes years ago who told me something that was like, um, he probably told you this too. He wrote that book, uh, make it, I think it was called as a musician or something. Um, making it that's what it was called but he said show people the process not the the result or something like that and so i've been doing that too i if i go to a uh, uh something and i talk to someone i take a picture of the event or something and use that as the the blog picture instead of just you know the professional headshot which doesn't everyone has a professional headshot it's not interesting you know it's not it's not really relevant to our conversation or maybe i have a picture of the two of us at a clarinet conference i'll use that instead because it's like such a more cool picture to kind of use you know and um so funny i, I love the the content you put, put i think it's great by the way your editing is is wonderful and the the, the the video looks great i found the same thing with my iphone i tried a couple of videos it just looked horrible and i thought it was uh and i'm also a little bit weird in front of a camera i'm like it's it's different than the um the audio it's the editing's different like it's like, oh, I made a stupid face. I can't use that take, even though it sounded fine or, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, but, you know, I wanted to ask you, and this is just super off the cuff, but I, I have been just addicted to YouTube lately. I don't know what's wrong with me, but if I get a free hour, um, I am just watching stupid videos on YouTube. And not, not necessarily stupid, but they're often musical <laughs> in nature. But are you familiar with the channel called Davey 504? No, but I'll check it out. You have to check it out. He's a bassist, so slap like if you like Davey 504. Slap it now. <laughs> Do it now. Anyways, uh, ep Epico. No, I just wanted to be funny. He, he does this kind of stuff. It's hilarious. So he's teaching and playing the bass through, like, absolute hilarious comedy and memes, and it is the funniest thing. I think I've watched, like... 50 episodes of his hilarious programming over the past three weeks since I discovered him. And it is just so well done. And um, I'm just like, man, that's hilarious. So so what other bass channels do you like then? Because that was, that was one of my questions is, did you know of Davey 504? But also, if not, where are you getting your bass from? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, lo I love uh, uh, Discover Double Bass. Can't say enough good things about them. Jeff Chalmers started Discover Double Bass. I've had him on the podcast. I've had, I think, everybody. He's got eight, I think, teachers now that have done courses for him. I think I've had every single person on, I have had every single person on the podcast talking about their course, and it's been fun to watch him get better. So he's got, he puts a lot of content out on YouTube, and then he sells these courses. And he's just, he's good people all the way. I'm actually going to the UK to film a course for his site in February for adult beginners, and I'm having so much fun building that out. Um, so I follow Discoverable Bass. I also, Scott's Bass Lessons is an electric based channel. It's yeah, I love that. Extremely large audience. Scott's the closest thing. He's like the Peter McKinnon of, of electric bass blogging where he's got his personality comes out and he's just fun and goofy. It's funny because I can be a fun and goofy guy, but like, I'm not, I don't, I, I don't, 
I, the way I, I watch my videos and they're they're just very serious and, about, and to the point and whatever, but that's just sort of my personality in that medium. I'm not going to try to be somebody I'm not. Um, I think that's a super dangerous thing. Uh, so those are the two I follow probably the most in terms of base. Um, people recommend a lot of things to me and I, I check them out and share them out on my blog or whatever, but those are probably the, the two that I've watched the, the most fun. But I go down YouTube rattle, and especially with this whole new camera thing, oh my goodness, I've been like for going through Casey Neistat archives, you know, for years, years and years past to, to, I think I've watched every Peter McKinnon video and I've watched a lot of reviews of stuff and travel bag reviews. And I, I've definitely gotten into that. And it's a funny editing process for sure. So different than audio. Um, for, for me, what I, the, the flow, and I, I don't think I'm going to have time for this until next summer, probably. So I'm probably done with this for a little while, but I was in this really good, uh, routine of putting out a Wednesday video on a top. That was about mm. five minutes long. And what I would do is I would start by writing a blog post. And I love being able to repurpose things like this. So I would, I would write a blog post. And then the then from the blog post, I would like write out kind of a, a, a workflow of how to make the video. So by writing the blog post, I've thought through the topic. And then I would write out like bullet points that I want to hit in the video. And I'd have those on the iPad. But I have to make sure I'm not reading off the iPad because i got to look at the camera. So it's like these little things you don't think about in audio. Yeah. And, and then... I know I'm going to screw up a lot, but I also know that I have an editing process and I know what I look like when I screw up. So I've gotten really good at the key board shortcuts and premiere pro to just like edit all those little things out. And mm -hmm. I know that that's what tons of YouTubers do anyway. So I don't care if I screw up. I just stop, say it again, say it again. And I get this editing process, but I also need to think about what shots do I need? So I'm going to yak about the topic, but I don't just want Jason's talking head for the whole video. I want some of the base or I want, I put on my uh, 50 millimeter lens and I get some like slow-mo of me, like moving over my bow or moving over the music, or maybe I want to capture some iPad screen sharing or something so I, have to, I sort of think through what i want visually and then i collect all that and then there's the editing process and generating the thumbnail and all that it's it's like it's it's a the workload equivalent to what i used to do for the podcast um so uh but now that tra travel scene is season is heated up and we're into that i just like if i have a free week in san francisco i can do a video if there's anything else going on that week i just for me i can't do it but that's sort of where i'm at no, I love it. And, you know, I think that that's something I'm, I'm excited to get into, but I'm also nervous because I know it is a lot more time commitment. Um, and uh, but, you know, it's one of those things that like people seem to be gravitating towards video content and I don't blame them. I, I love it, too. And it, it can be so engaging if done right. Um, and it can also be done very wrong. Like I <laughs> have seen some channels where I'm like, oh, this is this is bad. Usually it's older stuff, though, at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a tough thing. And I, I don't know if you found this, too, but I found one of the hardest things about producing content has been injecting my personality and trying to figure out how much to do that of. Um, and I was, I was listening a while ago, this is kind of random, but uh, the company called Bovida, which does um, humidity packs, you probably use them. They they, they license the humidity packs to D'Addario. They, they make the, uh, the ones you put in your case. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Those humidity packs. I know what you're packs. talking about. Yeah, anyways, yeah. they make those, they have a podcast and they have two podcasts. I think uh, I can't remember the names, but one is about like um, their cigar industry because they obviously use these for cigars in the humidors and they also use them for instruments. So there's one that's about like just general uses of the product, too, because they know not everyone's in his cigars. But I was listening to the cigar podcast and just to get a feel for <laughs> I don't smoke cigars, <laughs> but but uh, getting a, a feel for kind of what different shows are like. And um, one of the interesting things they said at the beginning of one of them was we want to create a cigar that not everybody likes, but that some people will love. And I was like, that is the goal of online content right there, because you can't be something everyone likes. You're going to be, you know, just a bland nothingness. And but but if enough people if you create something just big enough of a niche that that enough people can love, it's the perfect content. So. That's a great way. That's a great way to look at it. And yeah, you don't want to be somebody you're not too. And you're, yeah. you also get, it's another skill. You get better at it. The more you do like my, I, even just in terms of speed of it. Well, first of all, I think I, I've only done like eight 
of these videos where I was trying, where I've been trying to do a good job making videos. The first one was ter looked terrible. I mean, I, I sounded fine because I know how to talk on on mic or on screen. But uh, and, but then I I feel myself getting better as I do them. And now I've taken a break, so I'll come back and I'm a I'll be a little rusty, but I'll get back into it. Um, I just think that approaching any project, yeah, it's not going to be for everybody. But the the you know just just getting something out on a regular basis and thinking of it as a self improvement project is just such a good thing for anybody to do. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin. I don't know if you follow Seth Godin, but one of the he's a, a well known person in the marketing world for people listening. Um, he has been doing a daily blog for I think. 12 years, 11, 12 years at this point. And one phrase he uses, and he started a podcast recently, which is very cool. Um, one phrase he uses over and over is here. I made this, you know, that's just mm. such a powerful thing. And I love that every week, twice a week with the podcast. And when I can once a week with the blog, I just to th these people out there, I just say here, I made this. Maybe you like it, maybe you won't, but uh, I think that that's, I think it's one of those profound things. If you really think about it. Well, it's one of the funny things too, when you create something that people will love, one of the you know yin and yang things about the universe is that some people are going to hate it too. And you have to be okay yeah. with that being all right. And what I was just going to say about Seth Godin is like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can't stand Seth Godin. I've always been like this because Garrett, Garrett uh, Hope and I talk about this too. And he's like, you got to read this book. I'm like, you know, I tried it. I just, I honestly couldn't get through it. <laughs> I had to get rid of it, but we've just never seen, I maybe should try it again, but it's, try, uh, well, if you haven't, if you haven't tried the podcast, give a, give I'll, a sample yeah, of the podcast. It it's, it's a fun, he, I, he, he may be, I think for some people, they immediately love him. For me, it was an acquired taste because I didn't quite, um, I didn't quite understand. Uh, and but I'm that way with a lot of things. I've become a huge fan of the Joe Rogan podcast. I couldn't stand that podcast. Um, and, and part of it is, it, but but I sort of came to realize what's good about what the, the, the I I now enjoy and I get a lot out of it. I don't listen to every episode, and I definitely don't listen to ones that are like real fight oriented or bro yeah, oriented. Yeah. But I. <laughs> but, but um, it's really um, it's interesting. Um, I've learned a lot from him and, and a lot of uh, other people not in the music world. You know, I've learned a lot from Tim Ferriss and his podcast. I've learned a lot from Fizzle, uh, the the online. Uh, uh, I don't even know how to describe Fizzle. They they help you just build a an entrepreneurial career. Um, I probably, and another twelve podcasts probably. So that's going to be the end of the segment for today, but I'm going to have uh, Jason back on next episode to talk about where we kind of finished off here today, which was being entrepreneurial as a musician and also building a portfolio career and just kind of the financial wellness side of being a musician. So thank you so much, Jason, for coming on the show, and I look forward to chatting with you again next time. Great to be here. Thanks, John. Be sure to check out Jason's website at contrabaseconversations.com. And uh, you can get his podcast anywhere that you uh, get your podcast, which I guess, are you on Spotify now too? Oh, yeah, Spotify, yeah, Pandora so Spotify, now too. Pandora, yeah. the whole, <laughs> the whole uh, nine yards. So uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, and we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. I know sometimes they run a little long, but you know what? These longer episodes somehow seem to manage to get the best listener count sometimes. So obviously you have the patience for it if you're still here at the end with me. I also want to invite you to join me on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Clarinet. I'll be announcing a really awesome giveaway. It's in a secret box right now on my desk. And I'll be opening that box and showing you what's inside at 2,500 subscribers so head to youtube.com slash clarinet also don't forget to check out our sponsors bakun musical services has an excellent coupon where you can save 10 percent on your next accessory purchase that includes things like the popular vocalese mouthpiece just head to bakunmusical.com and use code clarinet at checkout the Dairy Woodwinds has their new Reserve and Reserve Classic and Evolution Reads, which you can check out at your local music store. You can pick up a box right now by going to clarinet.com slash reads. And our newest sponsor, Encoda. This is a really cool app. It's kind of like Netflix for music and lets you stream music scores directly to your iPad or Android device, and you can get a free trial. Just search Encoda on your device today. That's N-K-O-D-A.
Okay, that was part one of our conversation. Thank you, Sean. So much fun to chat about these topics. And here we go with part two from the Claire and Eat podcast. <laughs> A well-rounded music career in the 21st century requires knowledge of not only music itself, but also social media, networking, navigating family life, finances, and so much more. On today's episode of the show, I focus on the business side of things with Jason Heath, who is a master of building a portfolio career. We discuss secrets for working with ideal clients, share some real horror stories that are hard to believe but actually happened, what it was like getting started, and how to decide when it's time to, quote, blow up your career, as Jason says, and completely change gears and try something new. Jason was also the feature guest on episode 122, 46, and 52 of the podcast, so if you enjoyed today's conversation, check out the website at clarinet.com. There's plenty more to listen to. Of course, there's even more to listen to at Jason's own podcast, which you can find at ContrabassConversations.com. He has nearly 700 episodes now about everything double bass, and his show gets almost a million downloads a year. Definitely worth checking out. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast at Clarinet.com, the show about all that's new and neat with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. It's Black Friday weekend right now, so if you're listening to this episode between November 29th and December 2nd, 2019, head on over to the merch store on the website, clarinet.com, and enjoy 20% off any t-shirt, sweatshirt, or hoodie. So it's a great chance to stock up, keep warm this winter, or grab a t-shirt for a clarinet nerdy friend of yours. If you'd like to get access to today's episode and dozens of others in extended ad-free format, head on over to the members section of the website for as little as $1 per month. Also, I've got a mystery box here that was sent to me by Bakun, and I'm going to be opening it up when I hit 2,500 subscribers on YouTube. If you want to see the unveiling, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash clarinet. Thank you so much for listening, and today's episode was brought to you by the generous support of the following sponsors. Have you wanted to try D'Addario Reads but weren't quite sure which to choose? Here's how to decide. Reserve Reads come in a white and blue box. They feature a traditional blank and are perfect for those who want to focus sound with the quickest response possible. Reserve Classic Reads come in a white and purple box. They feature a thicker blank that provides an expanded tonal color palette, clarity of articulation, and added flexibility. And the new Reserve Evolution Reads come in a white and yellow box. They feature our thickest blank and have a heavy spine for added projection and exceptional tonal depth, warmth, and flexibility. You'll have to try it to believe it. Try Reserve Reads now at your local music store or head to clarinet.com slash reads to buy a box right now. Encoda is a new app that lets you stream, practice, and perform tens of thousands of music scores. It's kind of like Netflix, but for music. Get a free trial today. Just search for Encoda on your device's app store. That's Encoda, N-K-O-D-A. Take your clarinet to the next level with a new mouthpiece, barrel, or bell from Bakun Musical Services. With free shipping to the United States and Canada, 14-day easy returns, and expert advice, you can be sure that you're making the best choice for your musical needs. After all, the best time to upgrade your clarinet was yesterday, but the second best time is today. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com and save 10% on your next accessory purchase. That's code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com. So I'm back again today with Jason Heath. Jason, welcome back on the podcast. Good to be here. Love the show. Thanks for having me back. We got to do this again every couple of years and sort of uh, check in with what we're up to. Maybe even sooner than a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you're just listening and you've, you're new to uh, Jason Heath and his work, he's the host of Contrabass Conversations. And also you'll want to check out, I think this will be now the fourth episode of him coming on the Clarinet Podcast. He's got a book you can check out on Amazon. He is the real deal as far as like online content. And I think you're probably the oldest or one of the oldest music podcasts out there. So you've been going at it for a long time too. So hopefully for a long time more. 12 years and counting. So <laughs> your podcast is almost a teenager. It's going to be a bit unruly soon. <laughs> I know. Exactly. exactly. Look out world. <laughs> you can almost take it for a beer. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I want to have you back on because for a long time, and I, I do hope to touch on this topic with more guests. That's one of the great things about podcasting is that you can, no two conversations are alike. I, I feel like I could have um, this same topic conversation with with every person who's ever been on it and get great insight and, and interesting um, information. But today I want to talk a bit about financial wellness for musicians and kind of being entrepreneurial and building a portfolio career. And I feel like these are things which you've not only successfully done, but also successfully blogged about um, 
and and talked about on your show extensively. So um, just to start off, like what are the areas of your life right now, if it was like branches on a tree that contribute to your sort of musical um, well-being from a financial s- perspective as much as you're comfortable sharing <laughs> oh yeah no for sure no I'll share it share it all and i actually thought for a while it would be fun to like go uh, go along with ha- kind of document my journey to san francisco and just kind of like share how every month was going and how things were going financially in ter- because i sort of took a risk moving out here we all take risks in our life but i had this really healthy career built up in chicago i was i and uh, the elder symphony a regional orchestra that i was in that orchestra for 16 years that was probably about 12 weeks of work eight to 12 weeks of work depending on the season a really really solid orchestra i also was subbing in the lyric opera of chicago grant park symphony playing a lot of gigs there i was also a teaching high school orchestra full-time at what is arguably the best program in illinois or one of the best programs in illinois certainly uh great pay great benefits great area. and then i was also teaching teaching at DePaul University part-time and also uh, conducting the uh, occasionally guest conducting the Chicago Youth Symphony rehearsals and and Midwest Young Artists rehearsals and the conducting career was blossoming and then my wife got a job in San Francisco and I thought oh uh, I don't know if I want you know I was sort of happy with my life in Chicago I'm a Midwesterner and I was I didn't really have to think about finances, but I mean, I just had money appeared in the account. Everything was good. We were saving and I, but all that work was tied to Chicago, right? It was all playing. It was all teaching. It was in this one place. Well, okay. Move out here. I start looking for teaching jobs. There weren't any out here. Okay. I I'd been in Chicago 23 years. I'm moving to a new area, the Bay area, San Francisco. There's no shortage of bass players here. Lots of people, they they don't, nobody's looking for another bass player to play a bunch of freelance gigs. Mm. Uh, So I thought, well, what should I do? And I had had this podcast for, for a while. I started this thing in 2007. Uh, This is 2015. We're thinking about this and it had been popular. I knew it had been popular, but I was thinking, what do I want to do when I moved to San Francisco? Do I want to just kind of rebuild the same career as I, had in Chicago, uh, which was a playing and teaching career. Nothing wrong with that. That's a very standard career, right? I think I think yeah. most people have some mix of that, and I still have a little bit of a mix of that. But I'll get get to what I, how that's changed. I decided that I decided to take a risk and just pretend the podcast was my job, and and just have faith that opportunities would develop out of that, mm-hmm. and and I. I, so I, I decided let's, I wasn't finding a teaching job out in San Francisco. There was no guarantee of playing. And then I thought, well, what do I do? The, those are the only skills I have. Um, what am I going to do? Like walk dogs? Well, I'm scared of big dogs. <laughs> so that's not going to work. Uh, I could drive for Uber or Lyft, but I did. I actually had a Honda Element and they don't allow you to drive for Uber or Lyft with that car because of the doors. So I thought, well, I can't oh, even weird. drive for yeah, I know. So, so I thought, well, I am, I'm overqualified and there are no opportunities that I can really see clearly, but I have this podcast. So I just, while I was still back in Chicago, every night and I was living apart from my wife at this time. So it was like a rough year. She had already moved out to San Francisco. I did the math and I realized we couldn't pay our bills just on what she was making. So I had to do something. So I stayed in Chicago, was miserable. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to move to San Francisco and we'll figure it out. But I, I, I knew I was going to be on, you know, lose my jobs uh, moving out there. So I just started pouring all my nights and weekends into the podcast. I rebooted it. I started doing get interviews, uh, not a hint of monetization in sight, just getting it going. I had done it. And then it had been five years since I'd really put out any episodes. So it was just like this thing hanging listless on a tree, you know, for years. And, and I got it going and all of a sudden the numbers started to go up. I was looking in my Libsyn, the company I used to host, I was looking at the statistics and I was seeing all these, all these people were listening. I thought, well, they're surely I can leverage that somehow. Um, and, and I, but I thought, let's just move to San Francisco and let's not try to get advertisers back yet or anything. Let's just try to like show that I'm around again. Cause I didn't want to like, you know, I had this weird five-year gap and then I put out three episodes and I start asking for ads. I thought, eh, 
eh, that's not, uh, but I thought surely I can monetize this podcast enough to support myself. You know, mm-hmm. if I have this big an audience and, and my career has turned into a, a very common podcaster career. It's a, because of my podcast career, I have all these opportunities that have developed as a result of having the podcast. And I'll bet you've kind of found yourself in that boat too, right? Well, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause people, um, they don't necessarily just see me as Sean anymore. It's like, Oh, that's the clarinet guy or something like that. And, uh, yeah. it's been kind of interesting because I even didn't really think of myself that way. The podcast has felt like something that I'm just kind of doing and, and, uh, but it's really grown as, as a brand and something people are interested in. And, and it, it gives you a bit of, um, I guess sort of notoriety if that's the right word, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is very hard to come across. I mean, it's if I wanted to just build that by being a clarinet teacher and and be you know build an international presence or something just by teaching lessons, it would be almost impossible. You'd have to yeah. like I don't even know what you do because I haven't walked that path, but you'd have to be someone like Cal Opperman who has you know he's resonated through the generations <laughs> as a teacher or something like that. It would it would be so different, and I think that those people who are able to um, leverage not necessarily to the extent even, but even a little bit of kind of new media and the way the world works these days, I think that they're definitely putting themselves in a, in a good position for other opportunities. Um, even if it's not to the same scale, if that makes any sense. Oh yeah, for sure. And I just realized I didn't even answer your question. I, I told you my long, long backstory. <laughs> to get the same but well, let, it's let me part of it forward. though, because that's your creativity that's led to this sort of tree of opportunity that you've really sown for yourself. Right. Right, right. So actually, maybe a good, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing right now. And then we can f- talk about how, how I got there or how people can get there. So like what my, my suite of activities, uh, which is a phrase I probably use too much, but I like, everybody's got a suite of activities. Even if you're in the San Francisco symphony, you do that and you teach privately or whatever. So the bulk of my income these days and just the work I do comes from Eastman strings. I'm their product manager for bass. And that involves uh, everything from uh, designing new products to, artist relations to uh scheduling out uh you know business plans for uh, tracking numbers and sales and where do we go from here and who do we connect with and who do we partner with and it's a really interesting job i i i sort of fell into that um and my podcast definitely helped but a lot of that is a, a result of connections i built in chicago while i was teaching orchestra so these are you know sometimes we have things that we do in and it's years later that they sort of come to fruition. I never thought I, I bought, but I bought their instruments back when I was an orchestra teacher and always liked the instruments. And so uh, fast forward and I do that. So that, and then probably the next biggest chunk of my career is, is events getting, getting uh, whether that's a clinician coming and doing a teacher in service event or going to uh work at a base camp or going to cover an event. And it varies year by year. I've been cu- hired to cover solo competitions uh, and uh, all kinds of events. And so then that's, that's another piece of the pie. And then uh, I've been hired to just as a consultant in general for many uh, one-off and ongoing projects, uh, book launches uh, and, and, and uh, uh, actually several book launches I've done. And whether that's getting the social media built up for them or just general strategy or partnering with them through my podcast and email list and that kind of thing. And then another chunk, that has been surprising is uh, donations of things I give away for for zero plus dollars. So I have, for example, a technique book that mm. I put out and and it has uh, generated quite a bit of revenue for me. And it's free, but give what you want if you want. Oh, interesting. And that, And that I never thought that that would be a big chunk of what I do, but that, uh, and let's just say that an affiliate revenue in general is a piece of the pie because I have some things that have done very well online and, um, and I I have, when you Google strings, I I haven't checked it recently, but some of the things I've written that contain affiliate links, uh, come up. So a a decent chunk of my revenue actually is affiliate, uh, money from things I've, I've, I've done in the past. Um, um, so just to then, fill in for yeah. those listeners who maybe aren't sure, <laughs> affiliate right. revenue, like, so we're, we're talking about a lot of stuff that we're really familiar with because we're into the podcasting and the website making and all this, mm-hmm. all these things. But if you're just getting started with like, well, where do I begin online? Um, 
Affiliate links are probably a tough place to begin, but as you grow, they're going to be a thing that becomes part of what you do. So basically what that is in the most basic sense is like if I talk about a book on Amazon, I just include a link. And if you click that link and you buy the book on Amazon, you get a commission. So, and that's just a, if you scale this up, it can actually be quite successful as a revenue stream. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways you can imagine this to work. Um, you just have to kind of get creative and you don't need a really big website to make it work either. You just need a, a good niche with something people are interested in and a product that's going to resonate with those people that they're actually going to buy. And then you just get a kickback. So, um, what I like about affiliate revenue as a job or as an income source, I mean, is a job is tied to time and affiliate revenue is not. So like right now, I could make a small amount of money off of something I talked about three years ago and I don't have to put in any more time. So my investment in that moment is theoretically infinite, although it, it won't be, but <laughs> it, it would be. But what I mean is that, you know, you go to a job, let's say you work at Starbucks, you make your 10 bucks an hour. It's not like three years from now, you're going to get another little bit of tip from that hour that someone was happy with. That's never going to happen. But affiliate revenue, maybe you didn't make any money, but over 10 years, that link made you $50. So your one hour is worth fifty dollars if you look at it that way. So that's kind of how affiliate revenue works. If that if that's a good explanation, I'm not sure. But that, that that's a great explanation. Yeah, no, it's a wonderful explanation, and it's something I never I never uh, uh, thought that it would amount to much. But but I've written almost four thousand blog posts uh, over the years, and and many of those come up at the top of the search results or near the top for for whatever that. Time. I never did it really intentionally, um, which is probably a good way to do things. But it's it sort of resulted that. And then the, the last piece of the pie uh, financially is I, I do play some and, and play. I was just playing the San Francisco symphony last week. And I, I play in a chamber orchestra in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, go down there occasionally do the other occasional gig, but that, this, that I have, this is the least amount of playing I've ever done in my life is right now. And mm -hmm. then at, at events I go to, I, I frequently play, you know, some chamber music or maybe some solo stuff. And then, and then finally teaching, which is the smallest piece of the pie for me these days it used to be the biggest, <laughs> but now it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I have a couple of private students. I go into a school, um, and then I've had many, many projects in these, even these four years since I've hung out my own shingle that have, that have, uh, worked or sputtered out and died. And I've gone in all sorts of different, different directions and wasted, I don't know if wasted is the right word, but <laughs> hundreds of hours pursuing something that, that nothing financially came of it. So I'm sort of figuring this out myself, but I, I kind of have that clinician consultant, uh, business side of things career. That's most of, that's where most of my income comes. People might, especially people listening to podcasts might say, where's the podcast in that list? Well, I've decided to make the podcast its own self-generating thing. So any revenue coming from that just goes right back into the podcast. I love that. And you know, I, I love this mentality of the sort of the pie too, because one thing about a pie is that you can always make the pie bigger and it's, but it's always, you know, still a, a circle. It's always complete. Right. So, but if you only have one piece, it's going to be kind of a very small circle. Right. So, so one thing that I've realized too, is that some of these revenue streams that I have, for example, I, I've got like for the podcast, there's Patreon, um, even myself. I mean, I do some teaching, I do some playing, I do some advertising on the podcast. I sell merchandise. I have Patreon. There's some affiliate programs. Um, there's, you know, if I really think about it, oh, there's some YouTube ads, whatever. There's like seven or eight or maybe 10 different little revenue streams, but little revenue streams times 10 add up to something reasonable. And so you can live a life on that. And so if you are trying to, to produce, uh, anything really, if you're just trying to have a career in music, it's, you probably can't live off of just teaching. You probably can't live off of just playing, but maybe playing and teaching and doing some talking and traveling. And, and, you know, if you think of five different things you can sort of put together into a career, all of a sudden you, you can live a reasonable life as a musician, but any one of those maybe can't support on its own. Right. Right. And that's what our mutual friend Garrett Hope has titled his podcast, Portfolio Composer, A Portfolio Career. And if you look at the history of music, what we're talking about is what musicians have done uh, it, for generations. <laughs> yeah, forever. And it's what not, you know, people outside of the world of music think of it as the gig economy. It's something that... that that is happening more and more uh, across the spec across the board, uh, professionally speaking. So uh, everybody's sort of adopting the traditional music lifestyle, whether they want to or not. So it's interesting, and I wonder your thoughts on this, just to kind of uh, I don't know, stir the pot a little bit. But soon I'm going to be having a guest on called Stephen P. Brown, who I've talked to before. We actually had a great conversation. Um, I can't remember the episode, but you can check it out on 
on carneat.com if you're interested. Um, he talks, he's kind of of the opposite mindset where he believes that musicians, if they push in the right direction, can build a performance career that's entirely of performing and that this portfolio mentality is kind of a little bit of a compensation or something like that. So how, how do you feel about, about trying to sort of, if you picked one of those pie pieces, trying to turn that into the whole piece of the pie, do you think that's possible or only in rare cases? Oh, I, th I think it's certainly, I think it's certainly possible. Um, and, and, you know, you can take an, uh, I think taking an entrepreneurial uh, abundance mindset in general, uh, you know, is that that's the most important thing rather than exactly how your pie is made up. If you do decide to do that and get really creative with how you can build that career, I, you certainly, I, I, Adam Ben Ezra is a bass player who writes his own music. He filmed all these like super cool YouTube videos and continues to he has a career going around the world, touring the world, playing his own music, solo double bass or bass in somebody else. I mean, he's built the, I, I have, I, I've seen so many, uh, I could think of a, uh, probably a dozen examples off the top of my head of people that have built their own thing. So if you, if you're open-minded, uh, the, the, the sky's the limit, uh, the, the classical crossover genre, the, uh, there are many bands, simply three is another band that I like. Nick Villalobos has been on the podcast several times and they just, they're in Phoenix, Arizona. They, they were friends. They said, Hey, let's just do covers, uh, and play on these groovy instruments. And they tour the world, these big light shows, playing, playing covers on cello, bass, and violin, you know? So I think that there's, you can certainly, you don't need to, um, invent your own, uh, uh, app or, or create your own special barrel that you're selling or, or what have you. Um, but I do think if you, it's, increasingly ever more challenging trying to land like a full-time symphonic job, for example, that is a challenge. I don't, I don't think I've thought about this so much, Sean, over the years um, <laughs> that there's, there's, I don't think we all need to be Jack of Jacks of all trades. And I don't think that it necessarily benefits, uh, everybody to just like learn a million skills that you're going to, you might end up using all those skills, but I think there's a beauty to, I don't think you need to maybe pay a hundred thousand a year dollars a year to do this, but I think there's a beauty in just going all in on something and just developing an Olympia Olympic Olympian style level of skill in something. Yeah. I think that that's something that will translate over to other aspects of your life. So um, I, even if it's almost impossible just statistics wise to get a job in something like the San Francisco, symphony or the new york philharmonic i don't think that you're necessarily doing yourself a disservice by training with intensity and really getting excellent at something so that's that's sort of my my conundrum I, and i i get asked to do talks on entrepreneurship and i have done that and i'm doing some in the future and i really struggle with with what uh, with with that I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it is true. Like I feel the same way sometimes. Like every hour I spend podcasting or watching Netflix is an hour I'm not getting better at the clarinet when someone else is practicing. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, and I think that that's kind of Stephen's point is that you know you want to become this sort of super niche of your performance and and charge what you're worth and all these things and and uh, grow that piece of the pie. The grow the piece of the pie you want to grow, <laughs> um, which is kind of that point. But I look forward to talking with him more about that later. But um, I definitely feel the same way though in the sense of trying to find what is my kind of thing that I want to be doing. And we talked about in the last episode about this, but there's kind of a mix. Like I need a little bit of teaching, a little bit of playing, uh, you know, some podcasting, my normal work. I also work um, running online sales and marketing for, for Bakun, which is a clarinet manufacturer. And um, this combination of skills and activities for me leads to a very fulfilling life. But any one of those, I don't think would like, I can't just do the podcast. I can't just play I can't I, I need to have that for me and but I understand that not everybody works that way some people are totally happy getting up in the morning going to their symphony gig and then coming home and that's and good for them Oh yeah. There are phases in your life too. Like yeah. I re rewind six years and I was teaching high school orchestra full time. I was doing all this youth orchestra coaching. I loved it. It was great. I was yeah. tired. I did not have any time, <laughs> not a lot of writing or podcasting those, those years, but I was, I, I loved it. And I, I, I think that 
One thing that's been really interesting uh, these last few years is going to the NAM show, the National Association of Music Manufacturers, this show in Anaheim, California. Over 100,000 people go to it. It's an industry event. And if you want to realize how much possibility there is in the music world, go to that event uh, yeah. because it is it's phenomenal all the thing all that's going on in music and what, what's particularly cool about that show for someone with a classical music background like me is things pertaining to classical music are maybe one percent at that show if yeah. that and all these people that that are thriving in the music business or prosper or making a career of it you know at, at the very least they're doing things that don't even have anything to do really with what I was trained on yeah. and so like like I don't yeah, I didn't even know what I didn't know so there is a lot. And so I do think chasing your fascinations, if you can do that without going hundreds of thousands of dollars of it into debt, that would be, that would be the way to do it. But, <laughs> but, um, the, and just really g g finding what you, what you wake up in the first thing in the morning obsessed about and, and just going all in on, I do think that, that, if you can, if you can find something you feel like that about, opportunities will present themselves. And you, and like Stephen uh, Brown, who by the way is going to be on my podcast soon oh, too, oh, nice. coincidentally, yeah, um, talking about I, it might be performing and just just doubling down and going all in on that. And if it doesn't work out, I did that for years. I took I think almost thirty or maybe over thirty professional auditions. I wasted, you know, like. I don't even want to think about how much money I spent on that and time and gigs I didn't take. And I didn't get anywhere, but maybe I did get somewhere because maybe I learned things along that path and I, I'm happy where I am now. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And maybe I had to do all that and go through all that to end up here. I've like felt like I've blown up my career several times and, and started over. And I think that's, that's the way it is for so many people. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's true. I mean, I, I looked back too and was thinking one time, like, that's so weird I did a music degree because I ended up doing like all this online stuff and and interest in in all sorts of things. And and um it's uh it would have seemed like I should have done or did do something else sometimes, like because yeah. my interests where they really lie, but but everything has added so much to my experience and and path that I'm not sure I'd really change all that much going back. Um but you know, one one of the things I, I love about uh people who have done the freelancing kind of gig mentality though, is, is they seem to be in two camps <laughs> though, or three camps, maybe those who are just starting out and they're kind of getting the ropes. And that's one thing I kind of want to help with next is anyone who's thinking about doing this gig economy. Like how do you, <laughs> how do you find your way a little easier maybe than we did? Um, and second, there's people who are in it doing it. And then third, there's people that used it to leverage themselves to move on or either gave up and now we're doing something else. But people who are no longer doing that, but did. <laughs> right. So I definitely went through all three phases. I started out like really struggling and I started out teaching. I have a funny story, actually. I was teaching um, a lot of in-home music lessons. When I, when I first graduated, I needed to make money and I needed to make enough money to not only feel like I could pay for my apartment, but I wanted to do normal things like have a car and go out with my girlfriend for dinner. Like these didn't seem to me to be things that should be out of reach for a musician, even if I was a musician. And I know a lot of people in music, they just feel like they, they can't make ends meet. I didn't want to be like that. I just, I don't know. I guess that's why one of the reasons I worked so hard, but, but um, so I had like 30 or 40 in-home lessons a week that I was doing and I wasn't charging appropriately. I think uh, for my city, it was too low, but it was like 50 bucks or something for the lesson. But when you, when you actually add all the math together, it was a lot of, of time and, and investment with gas. And we'll talk about expenses in a minute, but I remember talking with someone, he's like, Oh no, you really should be charging more than that. You should be charging like 70 or $80 to, to meet expenses. And uh, he wasn't entirely wrong. And, uh, but also I said to him, well, how many students do you have? And he said, Oh, zero. <laughs> I said, well, ah. I'd sure rather make, you know, 50 times 30 a week than zero <laughs> and charge, mm -hmm. you know, it's better to charge, you know, more appropriately what you can get or what you're worth than it is to charge an absurd number that you're never going to have any clients. Right. So, so I know that these, these numbers are tough because it's so different for every, every region and community and U S dollars versus Canadian dollars and whatever. But, um, but I think that it was kind of a valuable lesson. Like you, you, you need to set, he, he wasn't wrong. You need to set a price that's appropriate for your expenses and deductions and things, but, but you also can't charge so high that no one will hire you because that won't be a very wonderful position to be in either. So, so um, yeah, I guess that's the story, but I guess what I was interested in kind of is like, what are your tips for being in that first stage of someone who's looking for the gigs and trying to calculate 
not just what they're worth, but what they can get and how they can make a living as a musician. Yeah. First you gotta, you gotta have getting to that first stage, you know, so you gotta get to the point where you have enough to pay the bills. Right. Or, yeah. or what, and for some people that is getting, getting a day job or a part-time job working at Starbucks or, or a job like that and starting to build um, for other people, it's, it's really just going all in on the teaching thing or maybe some gigs break your way. But yeah. You want to get to the point where you're, you have, enough that you can be turning things down. And so uh, Seth Haynes, I believe the book is called Break Into the Scene. Also, Emilio Gorino wrote this great book called Make It. Oh, I mixed um, those either, up on the last episode for sure. I think, yeah. I th I think those are the type, um, those. And then one more book, uh, Angela Beeching's Beyond Talent is like, th those, those books are fantastic. And Seth's, what I love about Seth's book is he actually has email scripts. You can actually like just copy the email script plug in the name. And if you just follow his advice, you're going to, you're going to start to get some things on the plate. And it's also a good way for, um, just, it's, it's like a good, it's just a good way to, to get going. So that I would recommend any of those books, but I love Seth's. We both had Seth on the podcast. Um, and, and Seth is an example of someone who's now used it to leverage into the third category I was talking about. He's no longer doing the freelance ironically even though he's kind of the master of teaching someone how to how to build a freelance career he was able to leverage that into something a lot bigger i'm not sure what he's doing now but he's doing quite well for himself and he's happy with that he's also uh assisted with other book launches and things i mean he was able to really do a good job hitting the podcast circuit um leveraging his book to like i think it was number one on the the you know the, the categories that he was in on amazon and yeah. uh, it is a great read that i, I recommend you know it's funny angela beeching um you're like the 40th person to recommend her book and I, I have to read it. But a couple weeks ago, she actually contacted me and said that she wanted to come on the show and she's, she's listened to her something for a while. And I was like, Oh, that's so cool. This is, that's, that's really neat. So I'm going to have well, her on finally to talk about her book. Uh, everyone, people listening to our podcast show, they're going to be hearing the same guests because I have her coming up now. Oh too. my so, God. <laughs> so, let's just combine so they, them into Claire and eat let's, conversations. Let's just, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. Well, it got, it got me, I, it's a book that's been on my to read list. And that's another thing. This is the topic from last episode, but that's another great thing about the podcast is it forces me to like read people's books finally that I've been meaning to. Yeah. Um, so, so I read that, and it's, it's a wonderful book. It's, it is, it, it checks all the boxes of what you need to be doing and, and, uh, down to like managing performance anxiety. I mean, hers is like that. It's like a college course. And what I love about Seth's is it's, it's like, boom, got it done. Go use this. You, um, and then uh, Amelia's, I haven't read Amelia's book in a while, but he's a, another very entrepreneurial person. He launched even a special kind of end pin for the base, yeah. did a, a, a Kickstarter. I believe it was a Kickstarter for that. Um, uh, that didn't work out, but then somebody else approached him and they, and they, they ended up making this thing happen. Um, so yeah, getting that, once you're in that category, the, the one that's, I, I don't think it's actually that hard. I mean, that's an easy thing for me to say, but I, I, I think it might not be as hard as people imagine getting into that first category or getting from that first category to the second category to where you have stuff on the plate. You have You're to have resilience though. If you don't yeah, have that yeah. or grit, people used to call it. I mean, you need to be okay hearing know a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's just a long process. Like, yeah. like, like when I moved here to San Francisco, nobody was asking for yet another double bassist in San Francisco, but over time things, and, and though I'm spending the bulk of my time doing, uh, not playing and teaching, my name has gotten out, you know, and I get more and more calls. I generally don't, don't do those, but, but it, you know, I just, it took time even in Chicago, even though I lived there, once I started actually working, to the the second year was easier than the first and the third was easier than the second so it does take time you're probably gonna have to do things that you don't love but i think saying yes to everything uh is probably the best move when you have nothing yeah <laughs> and and then it's better to have too much and then kind of figure out uh there's going to be some churn and some chaos but you'll eventually if you if you focus on just doing a good job at what you're doing and showing up and being a good person, teaching the student well, being at the gig early, playing well, that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna, you're gonna, you know, write your own ticket. And then all these other opportunities that we're talking about and things that can develop, I think once you're in the industry, you're in the business, then that that's a great time to start uh, branching out and seeing if you can find some other ways to generate, generate some revenue. 
Well, it's so funny you say that the whole yes man thing, because that's what I originally thought. I quit my job. It was about 2009 or 10. I just graduated, been out for a year and I was working at a computer store and it was, you know, I was doing well at it. Actually, to be honest, I did like the job, but I knew that it's not where I wanted to be um, long term. And I just decided like I wanted to be a yes man in the music industry. I wanted to be able to say yes to everything someone called me for and try and fill my schedule that way. Well, the funny thing about it is it took a couple of years, but then I wanted to be, I changed my goal to be a no man. <laughs> I wanted to be able to say no to whatever I wanted because my schedule was already full or had stuff in it or I, the stuff I wanted to do. We talked about the three corners last time um, of the triangle, basically trying to fulfill either money, uh, satisfaction or career goals. Um, and that has worked. You start off needing all those opportunities. You have to say yes to everything, but then you you have to filter what, where it is you want to go and set kind of your your trajectory, right? And one of the best quotes I heard in that time was, uh, you are what you're becoming. And I think that that's really good for a lot of students, especially or younger players, because like, you're not that yet. But if you continue down the path, that's what you'll be. So yeah. don't worry so much, you know, and I wish that I had kind of realized that earlier, because I spent a lot of time and when you're younger, too, like when I was 21 or 20, a year is is a lot more time than it is now. That yeah. I'm in my 30s. It's like a year is like a reason. I'm like, oh, that's a year from now. Man, I better get started. Or, or um, but a year used to be like an eternity away. Yeah. And and now it's like, oh, this this goal might take a couple years to achieve. That's fine. You have to be able to accept the fact that things take time. I think that's an important. I agree. Yeah. I, I wish I hadn't spent so much time worrying. I was definitely, and and especially with there's an on predictability to doing anything freelance. Um, and, and, but after I did it for several years, I realized, Oh, even though the, the, P, the ratios are different every year. I, I pay all my bills, everything works out and there are busier times and less busy times. Um, for my personality, I really did enjoy that, that those seven years when I had a full-time job and it was like magic, the bank account money just appeared. I was like, <laughs> what, what, what did I do to earn that? You know, cause I was so used to like doing a thing and getting paid for that exact thing I just did. Right. Yeah. I just taught that student. Here's some money for that moment. I just played this gig. Here's my money for this week. And so it was really weird to go on salary. Um, but 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 there are advantages and disadvantages. And so I, I had about seven, eight years of just freelancing, about seven years of full time. And now I've been I'm back in, you know, working for myself and working as a consultant and everything. And and the, the big disadvantage to full time is just your 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 time is is, you know, claimed full by yeah. an entity. <laughs> yeah. And so I. I, I realized what I, I, I realized I took that flexibility for granted when I was freelancing yeah. the first time around. So now I, I treat what I'm doing a little more like a job and try to, but I, but I, and, and that is a challenge when you're when the nice thing about the teaching and playing uh, paths is that it's particularly the playing path is that you just kind of show up and it happens, right? Yeah. You don't, I, I spend a lot of my time kind of thinking about what to do next or thinking about how do I want to spend my time this day? That seems like a luxury, but when you're in it, it's actually really hard because you're like, Oh, I'm creating creative at this time. So I have to do this project at that time and not get on Facebook because I'm going to like burn that time. And I've only got like a, a little bit of it. Yeah. So yeah, th 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 those are the challenges with the, with the portfolio career. Well, me. and I think through those years too, like the beginning years and I freelanced basically exclusively for almost 10 years. So as a side note, getting a, a full-time job um, for me has been very strange too. At first I was like, wait a minute, I don't have to invoice for, for every hour that I've worked and, and like the paycheck just goes in my bank account every two weeks. That's, what is this magic? You know, <laughs> it was really weird. Um, but, uh, you know, if that's what you decide you want. And for me, I was tired of freelancing. 10 years for me was a long time and it was time to try something else and everything just has worked out. I'm pretty happy with the way that all that's gone. But but I remember at the beginning, um, there was a really good book I read. And I think that people need to do more reading outside of the music genre to get good at music business ironically like there's this book called book yourself solid and he talks about how to have you read this i've heard of the book but i'm writing it down so i read it yeah. so read the audiobook because he's actually a professional speaker now based on his own experience what he's done and the way he reads the book is just great uh, his name is michael port but um some of it seems a little gimmicky at first and you're kind of like okay it's a bit wishy-washy it's kind of but you apply some of these things to what you're doing and it's brilliant like one of his concepts is every year if you want to advance your career, if you don't want to advance your career in your, your consultancy firm, which, you know, is your music lessons firm or whatever you want to call it, look at it that way. You should look at it that way. They're your clients, not 
not your students. They're both. <laughs> They're clients yeah. and your students. But but he would say every year, doesn't matter how hard it is, trim the bottom 10%. The people you like le- working with the least, um, the people who are your most difficult, the people who suck your time, the people who don't respect your time, even if it's like you, it's hard to make the decision, still do it because you're opening room up at the top to get I, what he would call ideal clients. So the people you work with 10 years from now, you don't want them necessarily to be the same ones you were happy with working yesterday. You've got to always grow and expand and find your best clients. And and the way he would describe it is people who love to work with you are going to talk to people and suggest more people like themselves who you'll probably love working with. And if you let people stick around who maybe, maybe it's like 90% good, even that little 10%, it's like a weed in a garden. It's going to slowly going to overtake your whole garden if you don't do anything about it. You have to get rid of it as hard as it is because, um, and I, I I did this. I would look at my students every year for a while and like, I wouldn't just, you know, fire them. I wasn't quite as diligent as that, but it was like, you know, I'd, I'd maybe raise my rates or change my policy a bit in a way that I knew these people would kind of filter themselves out and, yep. and uh, it worked really, really well. And I started working with more people who I wanted to work with and it's, uh, I don't know. It's a strategy that worked for me. So it, no, it's a great, it's a great strategy. And I think you can apply that to gigs too. I, every time I noticed this, uh, especially when I was playing so much more that first time I was freelancing, uh, every time I let a gig go, like a cut, like I was principal base of this community orchestra and I just hated it. I, ha- <laughs> I hated the heck out of it. It was like the, my worst day of the, of the week, but I, the money they paid, I, I, I was living so cheap in terms of rent and stuff. Like yeah. I had that, I had that gig and then I taught some lessons that day. And I realized that that, if I just did that and nothing else, I could pay my bills. And so then I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I can lose the three grand a year or whatever it was that that thing paid. <laughs> and I, I made so much more than three grand ditching that gig. Cause it opened yeah. up my Mondays for so many other things and it was all better. And so both students, that's a great thing to do with students. Oh my goodness. Um, but also, uh, I let, the, I had this, I had this for seven years, I had this regional orchestra gig, uh, that I won't name cause I don't probably nobody's listening to it, but I got rid of that. And I was like, <laughs> I, it was like a weight had been lifted. I didn't miss one thing about that gig. I didn't miss the money I got. I made more money the next year. I didn't miss the time. I didn't miss the people. It was just like, uh, you know, one of those trust uh, your gut. You got to go with your gut. I I had a horrible experience with one student. Um, again, no naming names and, (laughs) but it was one of the few students I've ever actually like literally fired because I, I went to the house and I, I was teaching the lessons. And when I got there, I'd look at my watch. Okay. It's one o'clock. And I would go down and teach and I would then look at the clock on the wall. And when it said two o'clock, I would leave. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how a one hour lesson works. Right. So anyways, um, one day the kid got up to go to the bathroom and I still less, I still ended the lesson on time. And the dad came down and got super mad at me. It should go longer. It's not my fault. He had to go to the washroom. And I'm like, well, it's not my fault either. I mean, it's, it's not really a big deal. He's like, well, you know, it is a big deal. You leaving five minutes early every week. And I was like, what? And I was crushed about this. I, I couldn't understand how this could happen. And I, I thought, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm just, maybe my clock. Anyways, I beat myself up about this the whole weekend, feeling really guilty about myself. And this guy, the way he attacked me was really, really inappropriate. But I went to the next lesson at the house and I realized that his clock in the basement was five minutes fast. <laughs> so it wasn't, I tried to explain this to him on the way out. I said, look, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, this is, this is not my fault. <laughs> and anyways, the, the way they responded though was just so inappropriate. I was like, look, this has to be our last lesson. I'm really sorry, but like, clearly this isn't working out. And, um, you know, I, 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 and I thought to myself, you know, the time I spent beating myself up about that situation was clearly time I could be spending better, <laughs> you know? right. but, um, and that's an example of, that's not an ideal client. Like an ideal client to me would say, Hey, you know, well, first of all, they wouldn't be completely, you know, by the minute like this, but be like, Hey, you know, is there a discrepancy between our clocks? Cause to me, it's only, you know, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, just be nice about it. Have a, I'm a nice person. I, well, I hope so. And I want to have a conversation. I don't want to be you know, it was a really weird experience. Yeah. That's, and, and that's the thing. It, it can be so emotionally draining. Like the, the look at, look at what, what percentage of the people that you work with clients is a great way to think of students percentage, uh, and, and gigs you play are, are, are like sending out negative energy. You know, you yeah. probably got like 5% that's, that's contributing like 75% of your anxieties and frustrations. And just like, I've had some real challenging 
student parent situations over the year. And, and I had someone I was teaching public school too, which is tough because I couldn't, I couldn't fire them. <laughs> they yeah. were, um, but it, it, it's, it's amazing. You, I would never realize how much energy I was spending or time thinking about, you know, a certain person or a certain gig until they were out of my life. And then it was yeah. just like, I was like, wow. Well, um, if I could add a bit of another book, I hate to drop like 50 books per episode, but there's one called getting to yes by William Urey. And it focuses a lot on like, when you have an argument like that, um, you want to make it emotional because you care about your teaching, you care about your music, you care about what you do, but it's not emotional. You just have mm -hmm. to focus on what is the result you want from this conversation and just yeah. stick to that, you know, and it's, it's super kind of straightforward then that way. But, um, and another piece of advice for those people who are kind of in this sort of level two right now, um, I know that one of the hard things for musicians is to connect music and money, but you have to, if you want to make a living at it. Right. So, um, one thing I did with great success is I had, um, I offered people at the beginning of the year to pay for their lessons with a small discount entirely at the beginning of the year. Um, and it was amazing to me. I think that nine, I think I had 10 students that year and nine out of 10 of them did this. And it was crazy because I had a huge paycheck in September. But the thing that was really great about it is people were much less concerned about like the nickel and diming element of the weekly or monthly invoice, right? And also they were much less likely to miss lessons or care if they missed lessons. And what I mean by that is like, of course they should care if they miss lessons, but they wouldn't come after me for the money because they would, it would be more kind of the music and money weren't touching as much. So they, they yeah. knew that they paid for 40 lessons for the year up front and it's already been paid. So if they didn't show up, they're not going to come. It's not like I'm going to be billing them at the end of the month and have to have this conversation again. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They've already put it out there and it was such a great way to separate the two. And I loved it because I gave them a small discount, but the time I got back not doing 10 invoices weekly or monthly, was huge, huge time savings. And uh, I felt much, much better doing it that way. Yeah, I think people who who make uh, their teaching a substantial portion of what they do, uh, talking to a really good friend of mine, a uh, cello teacher in the Washington, D.C. area, he's done that for years. And he, it's like it's it, it's yeah, tr everything you're describing, uh, you know, in terms of just sort of like making it it just seems to make for a better, better uh situation in general and that that like they're your cl client coach client teacher kind of kind of like relationship i think i think it's a great way to think of it uh and i always tell my my students or the parents of my students like like you're you're getting access to me my my library my resources my knowledge my recommendations so it really is a relationship that extends beyond that you know, that hour, not that I want, not that we're, they're calling me every single day. And I have had some parents like that. So you got to watch out for that, but it's like something we're in this for the long haul. Um, and yeah, if you're as, as long as you're smart about, uh, budgeting out that money, that wad of cash you get at September and, and making <laughs> sure, you're, you know, um, yeah. it can, it can be a great way to, to work. Well, and for me too, it's a, a bit of a red flag too, for non-ideal clients, because I want people who are going to commit to the year or yeah. at least I, I think I did it. The minimum time was quarterly. Like I understand mm -hmm. not everyone can pay <laughs> the entire year, but, but like the minimum is quarterly just cause it saves so much time. And it also shows commitment. Yeah. You know, it shows commitment and respect for time on their end too. Cause a lot of them are like, Oh wow, this is great. I can save paying you three times. I can only pay you once, yep. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it really yep. sets the bar for the ideal client as well. So well, Jason, this has been another great conversation. Um, again, I feel like we could talk all day or all afternoon or, all week or something like that. So it's probably good to, uh, to have a time limit, but, um, yeah, I definitely hope to have you back on the show at some point. And, uh, as your YouTube channel grows, I hope to follow it. And I encourage all clarinet listeners to check out your website at contrabassconversations.com. And you can stream the Contrabass Conversations podcast anywhere you get your podcast, which we learned was Pandora, Spotify, iTunes, I guess, Apple podcasts now, Google play yep. the whole, the whole nine yards. So you got uh, it. Yeah. Anything else and, you'd like and, to add and, before we close? Oh, well, well, and I just want to thank you for, and, and, and folks listening to this on, on my podcast, clarinate.com. Sean does amazing work. Uh, I, I enjoy the episodes not being, I, I think one of the, one of the great secrets of what we both do is even though we're talking about, about 
our instruments in that world, the, 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 what we're talking about extends way beyond just that instrument. So you, you would have, you'll have a great time listening to that. And Sean really mixes it up in terms of like episodes, like, like episodes on even the life changing magic of tidying up. I think you had one. Did you recently. check that one out? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I love, I love dipping in and, and seeing what you got going on. So clarinate.com, check them out and anywhere you get your podcast as well. Uh, you can find that. Great. And for those of you listening on iTunes or Google Play, this will mark the end of the episode. But for those listening on Patreon, we're going to head over and do the lightning round questions with Jason here right away. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll see you next time or in the member section at clarinet.com. I think that it's uh, it's fun to change these up and it's fun to have some new things to talk about with people. So, Jason, what is one thing that you never leave the house without? I never leave the house without my iPhone. I, I You know, I, I've been thinking about uh, about having a phone-free day, but it just hasn't happened yet. So <laughs> it's too it's, dangerous. It, I can't work anymore. I don't even know my own mom's phone number. I couldn't call anyone. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I It has been a long time since I walked out of the house without my phone. I wish I had a better answer for that. But that's, so that's, that's, so that's what I, I should change the question, though. This is why I'm test trialing some of these. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what is the one thing you'd never leave the house without that's not your iPhone? <laughs> Uh, my, uh, I, I got to go tech again, my Apple watch. I love my Apple watch. <laughs> I, uh, I really, it, when I got it, I got it maybe four years ago. I, the, a few, I've had a, a few generations now, uh, and I didn't think I would use it as much as I do, but I really do like tracking my fitness and I'm used to checking the weather and control. And so it's just, I feel, I feel law quasi lost without it. Are you me? Because I had the exact same experience. I, I wasn't sure. I got it simply because I'm like that with Apple stuff. Um, mm. I thought it maybe would be a stupid product even. It was the first one where I was really questioning because I, I think it was one of the first ones that was designed without Steve Jobs. And yeah. I was like, what is this going to do? And then suddenly I started using it and I'm like, this is one of their greatest inventions. <laughs> it's really a great product. So I love it also at the gym and I think it has like a really positive impact on on my life. So Anyways, um, what is your favorite movie of all time? Doesn't have to be about the bass. <laughs> uh, I think it's got to be Fitzcarraldo. That is the zaniest, wackier, like by Werner Herzog. Have you seen Fitzcarraldo? No, I haven't. Yeah, I'll have to okay. check it out. It's, it's, it's uh, Werner Herzog. Klaus Kinski is the main character in it. Werner Herzog is this, this German director who's, everything is about nature. The sort of like the, the power of nature and how it crushes all of mankind's uh, ambitions. And this movie is, a, it's set in the, pr- in the jungles of Peru at where the, this, the, he wants to build an opera house in, in the Amazon rainforest. Oh, wow. And this crazy movie, it, it, the, the sort of center of the, the movie centered around, in order to do this, he has to drag a steamboat over a mountain. And he actually, in the Amazon, they actually do this. <laughs> they, they tear down part of the forest, very en- en- environmentally unfriendly, and actually build this at all these, it's, it's a totally bonkers movie. Klaus Kinski is a, uh, I think he was, a- a- like had serious mental problems and there, there were lots of, I think Werner Herzog had to hold a gun to him at one point during the filming. Oh, wow. uh, it's, there's a movie also called My Best Fiend about their relationship, not friend, My Best Fiend. Uh, so Fitzcarraldo, it's totally, it's all about music too and opera. And there's the, yeah, can't say enough good things about that movie. It's, it's absolutely uh, a, a very difficult movie to describe. Sounds awesome. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> What's your first musical memory? Uh, listening to what was my very first musical memory from when I was really young. I think it's I think it's eighties songs. You know, I was born in the in the late seventies <laughs> and I, and I remember, I just so clearly remember like the, when MTV became a thing, it was like this very forbidden and mysterious thing in, in my household, something for older kids. And I remember seeing like, aha, you know, and, and, uh, well, some of those, some of those early, early eighties, uh, and, uh, Adam Carolla on, on the new MTV news show and all that. So that those are my first early musical memories, not classical. So you must have been but, born late 70s then, not to prime. Late, 
Late, late uh, 76. So okay. mid 70s. It's weird because yeah. yeah. I was born in the 80s, but my first memories are also of 80s music. So it must be yeah. very, <laughs> very impressioning or something. Um, <laughs> what kind of car do you drive and what's your dream car? Well, I am car free. Oh, I am, that's I am, right. I'm, I'm this ridiculous bass player who doesn't have a car, a bass player without a car, only in San Francisco or New York City. Um, but my pre, my the car I had uh, was a Honda Element, and I like that car. That was a good car. You, you could fit all sorts of things in that. Um, I think my next car for that that I would use with the bass is the larger Prius. There are two Prius sizes, and the larger one also fits a harp, and my wife is a harpist and so just having the ability to move the harp is a real uh, you really miss not having a car that can move a harp so i think i think that's going to be the next one it's so funny when you pick instruments they don't tell you that you might have to down the road plan your future life in that sense around you know because buying uh, yeah. a, i imagine you guys would show up at the car dealership with a bass and a harp and be cramming them in the the vehicle <laughs> Just, yeah yeah you know. for sure yeah you ever go you go to a base audition and you see a lot of station wagons parked outside a lot, a lot of things with headbacks <laughs> well and i never had this problem really um but a while ago i was teaching at a music convention and i recently bought a camaro and um so i was there and i'm like telling this guy in the morning oh yeah we'll just ride in together he plays tuba you can't get a Camaro in the, you can't get a tuba in the back of a Camaro. <laughs> and uh, it was like, well, I guess you're driving yourself, buddy. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, but clarinet fits in the back of a Camaro. No problems. Just in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> what living band or artist would you travel around the world to see and why? I think I would, tr- I know, I know your answer is Radiohead. I would, or I would imagine your answer is Radiohead. <laughs> Um, one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I would be fascinated to follow Metallica around. Uh, I I just did an interview with the principal bassist here in the San Francisco symphony who play the, the opening of where the golden state warriors are, our basketball team, the opening of the chase center, their new, their new home. The first event in there was Metallica with the San Francisco symphony and, and Scott Pingle, the principal bass did this anesthesia pulling teeth, this famous bass solo from Kill 'Em All, the Metallica album. Uh, uh, he did that with Lars, uh, the drummer, uh, in front of two sold out crowds, 18,000 plus. Uh, it was, and it just made me remember how my first, my, that, that was one of the first albums I ever owned, you know, that I paid my own money for was Kill 'Em All on audio cassette. And I was such a huge Metallica <laughs> fan. I listened to that album once a day, every day for, I don't know how long. And I would be so, it would be so interesting to follow that band around for me. That's super cool. I need to change that question though. It needs to be what living band would you travel around the world to see? And why is it Radiohead? No, <laughs> uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> do you listen to Radiohead? I guess not, not as much as you do, but, no, no, uh, but that's I, impossible. I, 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 that's not, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I've got some more questions, but I know we did them last time. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much, Jason. It's always a pleasure talking with you and uh, hopefully someday if I'm smart, I will come down to San Francisco and we'll also get to hang out so I can leave this Canadian cold, snowy, it was minus 20 here yesterday. So yeah, no, no, you got to come out. I'm wearing a T-shirt. I'm headed yeah. out right now in my in my T-shirt. It's you have no idea what time of year it is here in San Francisco. Yeah, it'd be great to hang out. Uh, totally. So and 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 this is for your your uh, members, right? This these yeah, questions. this is for the Patreon well, then, members. Then let me give a shout out to the the thank you for supporting Sean's podcast. You're you're the good people here helping helping <laughs> out. That really means that really means a lot. So I think it's it's uh, just great of you all to do that. Really cool. I agree. No, thanks so much for the support. And uh, as always, you can check out the uh, Jason's podcast and website at ContrabassConversations.com. He also has got like tons of episodes on there. So if you ever get bored of Clarnit, which ooh, I don't know about how I feel about that, but <laughs> <laughs> but if you do get bored, you want to head over and check some awesome content out or even take up the bass, um, you can check out over 600 episodes of Contrabass Conversations. Now, you're, you must be coming up on 700, actually. Oh, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting yeah. there. Yep, wow. Slowly well, but that's, surely. <laughs> that's amazing. So congratulations on that great success. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, John.